All right. Welcome back from lunch, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, if you guys haven't noticed, Naval X has like mastered the hybrid events. Like, can we get a round of applause for all the staff that put this together? Because this has been an amazing thing, right? So we're actually going to have a speaker on stage, uh, Mr. Scott Barlett, and we're actually going to have a hybrid speaker, virtual world at the same time, Mr. Christopher Dillman. And uh, for the Department of the Navy's um, SSTR and SSBR experimentation cell. So this is actually pretty cool because I didn't even know this cell existed. This is why I love having this military agility forum and like getting to learn about all these great things. So if um, you guys are ready, you guys can have the stage and then um, the stage is yours. All right. Thank you, Ashley. All right. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Good enough. Um, so, good afternoon. I get the joy of being the afternoon uh, first speaker. So, uh, Food Coma is probably sitting in for everybody. We'll try to go quick, leave some room for questions and answers. So, I'm Scott Bartlett. I work at the Office of Naval Research. I actually come out of the Warfare Centers. Um, I've been detailed to ONR for the last four years, running the, the Department of the Navy Rapid Innovation Fund as part of the CIBR program. So, I work for Bob Smith and Rich Carlin. Um, Today, I'm going to talk about a pilot program that, that's been set up within the SIPR program to help small businesses learn about experimentation and facilitate that, that experimentation. So next slide, please. And I should, I'd, I'd like to point out, too, I've got Chris Delman online. Uh, Chris is down at, in, in the Norfolk area. Uh, he's actually seated at NWDC in the, in the FLEX program. Uh, he's actually the brains behind this, so any really tough questions get to go to Chris. Um, and we're going to do a tag team. I'll do the intro, and then Chris will actually do the meat of the of the of the presentation. So, like I said, the the goal. If you can, uh, next slide, please. The goal of the cyber experimentation cell is to facilitate, mentor, and train small businesses and their government TPOCs about experimentation options and venues. Um, the, the big thing I want to point out is we are not an experimentation venue. So this is not Antex or Coastal Trident or Trident Shield or anything like that. Uh, and we're not a funding source. So this we facilitate small businesses participating in venues with the funding they already have. That funding can be SBIR phase two, that can be program office funding, it doesn't matter, um, but it's we're not actually funding their participation in an event. That's part of the program. And if you look at most uh, cyber phase two programs, they're gonna do some sort of demonstration at the end of their program. They're trying to prove that their technology works and that it's ready to go into the field. What better way to do that than with warfighters in the field? So that's what they're gonna do anyways. We're just trying to help them do it better in a warfare fighting environment, in a relevant environment. So everything we're gonna to discuss today is, is how we're trying to help them do what they're already doing better. And again, this is, this is what Bob talked about earlier. The CIBR program is always evolving, trying to do things better uh, to help our small businesses get their technology to the hands of the warfighter in a production environment. Um, next slide, please. So uh, in terms of talking about an experiment and what an experiment is and why we want to experiment, an experiment is something that can prove the ability of a technology to fill a warfighter gap or a need. And that's really critical. This isn't just a, here's my technology, can you use it? Um, that's fine, that's a different thing. The experiment is we're trying to fill the actual need that the warfighter has. And the only way you can really demonstrate that is with the warfighters. So the, the big part that we wanna to get to in this is how can we demonstrate that in a relevant environment with the right people asking the right questions? And you're gonna see everything we've got set up is how do you ask the right questions so that when you go to the experiment you're getting what you need out of it in order to transition the technology. And that'll be the focus of what we're doing. Um, next slide, please. So 
So why do we do an experiment? The experiment is there to gain knowledge. And if, to gain knowledge, you need data. And, and you need to be able to evaluate that data. In order to get the data, you need a plan. You need to be able to ask the questions, what data do I need to make that decision? Why do I need it? What kind of data is it? Am I getting enough data? Am I getting too much data? Believe it or not, that it can actually be an issue is trying to do too much. So it's, it's understanding that scope and helping them understand that scope that a lot of this is doing. And then the biggest part that the team is really going to be able to help with, and Chris is going to go through a lot of the details of this, is dealing with all the environmental and other constraints and the requirements that you have to operate in, it, in an experiment. Uh, and and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between demonstrations and experiments and, and which venues are right and the complexity of venues. So we're looking at the whole spectrum. So that can be anything from you know, a tabletop exercise and something like an Antex or um, one of the other smaller events like a GIFX, all the way up to something out in RIMPAC, um, out in the fleet assets. So the level of complexity of where you're testing and what you're testing is going to change everything. If you're going on a ship at sea, um, you know, the spectrum environment, the RAD has, you know, battery certifications, all that stuff can really bite you if you're not prepared to ask the questions early and often. And that's the coaching and the mentoring piece that Chris is going to go through. Next slide, please. So I, I kind of touched on this, what's a, a demonstration versus an experiment. A demonstration shows knowledge. We, here's what we've done, we know what we've done, we're showing you what we've done. An experiment is designed to gain knowledge. We're gonna go out and test something and evaluate it against different variables and try to gain the knowledge, what's happening in this environment? What happens if it's in a saltwater environment? What happens if it gets hit by a wave? What happens if it gets swept by the radar of the ship that it happens to be on or the airplane that it happens to be on? Um, I can tell you lots of instances where commercial technology has been swept by a radar and it no longer works forever. Um, they're real things you have to worry about. And there's, there's procedures and protocols for all that stuff. And our goal is to help the, the small businesses and their TPOCs walk through that process so that they don't have the surprises at the end. Next slide, please. And really, uh, I probably, this is probably easier to see on the, the other screens. Um, so really, the, the fundamental three things we say, the DONSEC is there to facilitate, mentor, and train the small businesses and their TPOCs. Uh, that's the goal. Um, and it's really the small businesses and their government TPOCs, because a lot of this is as much training the TPOCs as to what they can do, because a lot of them may not even know that they have access to, to assets in the, in the field to do experiments on. Um, so teaching them that what they can and cannot do and, and quite frankly, the timelines for how to do this. You know, some of the scheduling of these events are one, two years out. Well, that's hard if you've got a SIBR program that's two or three years long, you need to plan early. And that's where we work with things like Paul Cole's STP program, talk to the, to the people early, you know, let them know what's going, you know, this is an option. This is people who can help you. Here's, here's how we can help you do this better. And that's, that's kind of the goal. Um, you know, the, the process is, is some of the, which venue do you need to, to demonstrate your technology? Not everything needs to go out to a rim pack in the middle of the Pacific ocean for a month on end. It doesn't have, it can be down at Camp Pendleton for, for a weekend. Uh, finding the right venue and the right experiment to demonstrate the technology that you have is a big part of that, that process. And that's, that's kind of the focus of the team is finding the right place to demonstrate the right thing and then ask the right questions. So not all environments are gonna get you all the answers. Um, a big part of this is also you're using assets that are already out there, that are already gonna be on an exercise. Um, I've done a lot of experimentation in the last 30 years. I can tell you, I cannot afford the fuel for a destroyer to go out for a day 
to test a piece of technology. Um, that's not going to be in any program plan I have. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to find out when they're already going out, they're doing the type of runs I need, and we're going to piggyback. And that's what you know we do with the exercises, preferably because we've got all the extra options of an exercise that's supposed to going on in a ship. But if we need to, we will. And there's a lot of small assets within the Navy that are better suited to do that. And the team is really good about understanding that. And, and they, they'll talk about that a little, bit, a little bit. And then probably the biggest piece we want to talk about is the facilitation of the government people through the whole process. So it's not just you got selected as a cyber company to demonstrate a technology. That's great. That's a big part of it. That's actually probably 80 or 90% of the problem. Um, but understanding the requirements of what you need to do and demonstrate at the end of your project requires the government people to be talking up front and that will get you that success. So if you're going to do an experiment, a test, you need to know what they're looking for. And the best way to do that is engage them early and often. And, you know, we'll reiterate that on and on and on and always getting the involvement of your TPOC and the program office to figure out what they really want at the end before, so they can make a decision to buy your technology. That's our goal. So we're trying to help you get the data they need to make a decision. So next slide, please. And then really, you know, there's, there's a couple barriers that we're all gonna hit. Um, this is true for government programs as well as, as small business programs. This, and a lot of our stuff is focused on small business, but you can take a lot of this stuff and just apply it to, to any technology that, um, program within the Navy. It can be the nice 219 efforts. It could be a regular um, basic R&D effort. It doesn't really matter. It's agnostic. Um, but you know, where's the funding coming from? Again, we're not a funding source. We can help you know, work with TPOCs to move money where we need to. Uh, modify super contracts as needed with with other people's money. That's fine. We can help you with that. But understanding the cost of doing experimentation and the timelines for doing experimentation are a big part of that. Um, and then you know the 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 requirements for going out on some of these exercises is a big piece. You know, lithium battery certifications and safety is you know something most people won't think about if it's a COTS product. But a Navy ship has got different rules in different environment. Um, not as much a deal if it's a Nantex, say a Camp Pendleton or something like that. A little bit more relaxed, maybe more appropriate in certain cases. But if you're going all the way out, you need to know all the rules, and there's a lot of rules. Um, but we can help negotiate, uh, navigate you down that path. Um, and then again, the right venue and the right environment. That's that's the best thing we can do. Is is not just throw you into the hundred percent solution when really the eighty percent solution is the right answer. So. Next slide, please. And at this point, I'm going to let Chris talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the SEC program and, and how we do this. We're going to see how this works. All right, Scott, how, how can you hear me? Can you give me an uh, audio check, please? Sounding good. All right, next slide, please. So uh, Scott did an outstanding job introducing us and, and, and what we do. Uh, again, our purpose in our existence is to mentor, train, and facilitate. That's our charter. We start, our, our really our focus here are the phase two and phase threes that are ready to and mature enough to actually show uh, a type of experiment that can produce data that can fill a gap or do something like that. And like Scott said, there are tons of challenges and wickets along the way. The naval experimentation programs, and I'll, I'll call it portfolio across all of it, O&R, the uh, other programs, Antex, RDT, &E, everything is enormous. There's approximately 20 to 30 different experimentation events going on, everything from a lab-based or uh, live virtual constructive environment all the way up to what they call fleet battle problems, which have entire strike groups going out. So how does the small business, you know, person and a TPOC who's assigned this project navigate through all of that if they don't have a test and evaluation background, they haven't been in this forum. There are so many different pieces and parts to it. So we like to take 
the what we call the Cyber Innovators. And the first thing we're going to do is have a conversation with them, get to know them, get to know what they're trying to do, and then we will help them navigate into that. Like Scott said, you don't always have to go out on the destroyer and be part of a fleet exercise. Maybe there's a walk, crawl, walk, run approach where we do something out in the field at Nav Air at Webster's Field, and then we go out on a naval ship. So that is some pieces right there that we're talking about. And we're really what we call, and we've kind of tailored it, the P sub T. What's the probability of transition? That's our end game, is if we can increase the probability of transition through experimentation and decisionable data to warfighters, then we've met our match, and that's what we're trying to do. Next slide. So lots of different things. So we try to look at here is what are our effects? What are our methods? So, you know, we want to provide and enhance transitioning through effective relevant experimentation. We've said that time and time again, but how do we do that? One, we've, we've actually just produced our first guidebook. It's out on our website. And this is the one-on-one basics to experimentation and it's tailored towards the cyber community. This has everything from, you know, what is an experiment? What are the different venues? what do things mean, what are engineering pieces, what are the operations aspects of that you're going to need. And, and there's lots of, it's the 101 guide for dummies. We are, and since we're a process oriented team, that guidebook is going to go over an annual review. We're still researching, we're still learning, and we're adapting that. So we will be looking at that guidebook uh, if anyone ha needs to do an experiment, I highly recommend going to our website and looking at that guidebook as a first step. Uh, the other part is the facilitation and lowering that entry for input. So you get a tr uh, TPOC out there, a new phase two server, they're energized, they're engaged. In, in this environment, the, the government doesn't always have the time to go through all of the major processes and things that have to happen and guide them through venues they may not even know exist. That's where we come in. We try to take that load off the TPOC and get them efficiently into relevant experiments and get the data they need. And it's hard to do because the timelines don't always match up. We, we try to have a dialogue with four to five different event sponsors every single month and trying to find that three-dimensional, four-dimensional picture that gets the end game instead of a you know two-dimensional, here's a spreadsheet, here's what you can go, go talk to the sponsors. So each of those events have their own entrance criteria, they have their own requirements, they may require cyber, they may not require cyber, all sorts of things that have to happen, and our job is to research that, get to know that, and help those sm small business innovators and those TPOCs navigate through that process. Training. Uh, Good example of this, we had a cyber innovator coming in. They had a sensor package. They wanted to go hook up to the IT network on a destroyer. They wanted to hook up to the navigation system on the on the destroyer. And the fleet just said, oh my gosh, no way. We can't do that and do this and that. What they truly needed was just an, a mobile platform at sea and a bunch of targets to look at to prove that their technology was doing what it said it was going to do and measure the things it was going to do. We got them out there on a test ship. We got a bunch of targets. We piggybacked off an Antex event. They got what they need, and we didn't have to go through the 18-month, $500,000 pro process to put something on a naval ship. The other thing that I want to hit on on this is that because these processes are meant for and it, whether it's a surface ship, a submarine, or an air platform, they are made for programmer records with milestones. But the Navy got really smart a couple of years back, and they started looking at, I don't want to call it a shortcut, but they started looking at how do we get experimentation in science and technology pieces. So a lot of these programs have paths that are for non-permanent changes, for temporary installs, and things like that. Getting into those communities, understanding those pieces and parts of those processes and then translating that to the TPOX and experiment matter, uh, the uh, cyber innovators is a big part of what we're trying to do. Next slide, please. These are just some of our core competencies. The, the team itself is pretty broad. Uh, we look at uh, 
analytical pieces. We have operational pieces. Engineering is, is a big piece. We have one of those uh, ship install SMEs on board that can understand that ship main process and all of the other things. Uh, cyber, uh, we're very strong in cyber accreditation and assessments. Uh, battery storage approvals. We just went through that and RIMPCO processes. So these are just some of the wickets and things. And if you've heard these things before, you know the nightmare processes you have to go through. Again, our idea is, to, our, our charter is to mentor, facilitate, and train and get the people together through those processes. We don't do those processes, but we can help them through and navigate through that. Next slide. Uh, you know, the engineering and the cyber and the battery storage, lithium ion batteries, uh, even lasers, those things are usually things that stick out pretty good when you're trying to do an experiment. Technology and the challenges for technologies to put on platforms and things is pretty apparent to most people right away. Uh, maybe not the timelines or the extents or the funding required for that. But the, the other pieces that usually get lost in translation are the operations and analysis pieces of an experiment. So if you're going to put a UAS in airspace, there are processes and pieces and things you need to do. If you're going to radiate on a ship, you're going to have a topside survey piece, but you're also going to have to get permission to radiate that device in the air. Uh, dealing with the FAA, FCC, and other industries, and the Navy has a process for that, a long bureaucratic process, and we help navigate that. Uh, environmental, this is one of the most overlooked pieces for anything going in the water. Uh, you try to put something out in the Bay of Hawaii, and you think it's pretty innocuous, and it's not a big deal, and you find out there's turtle migration or something, and you can't do your experiment. You spent a bunch of money to get out there, and you can't do it understanding those and talking to the sponsors and getting the right people to talk to you to put that in the water in the right spot is one of the things we like to do. Unmanned systems, huge these days, lots of different uh, navigation pieces to them. Um, there's a bunch of commands that are now set up to do this pretty regularly. Uh, we like to tap into those and, and I'll tell you, this is one thing we, we are in a continuous learning environment with. We learn, we do, we get better, we go back and we talk and then we project that information back to the sponsors. All right, analysis. This is probably the biggest point that is different from a demonstration to an experiment. If you're going to do an experiment, you have to have a plan on how to collect and then how to analyze that data to produce a report. That is the difference in you know many, many things. So if uh, technology goes out and it go, goes to an event and there's a bunch of admirals out there and captains and the Navy loves it, everyone loves it, then everyone goes back to their desk and they go about their business. Having a report, like a fleet experimentation report that is signed and briefed to three four-star fleet admirals and having the data that backs up not what did happen, but why it happened, what happened, and what was different is a game changer in the probability for transition. Again, our goal is end-to-end -end support um, in all phases experiment. So we're about three inches deep and probably a couple miles wide. But if we don't have the answer, we are also engaged with all of those commands and communities, and we try to stay engaged that can't answer those questions. Last plug I'll put in is to say that if you have a challenge and we're working with that team for that challenge and we don't know, we use that knowledge and we regurgitate that knowledge back out into a report and then we propagate that through. We update our guidebooks, we update our, our pieces and parts, and we use that knowledge so we're always learning, always continuing to develop. Next slide. These are just some of the focus events. There's, there's numerous events, but uh, it gives you a nice little um, snapshot of some of the things teams we're working with. Uh, Trident Warriors are good and fleet experimentation are larger events. And then some of the smaller like uh, joint integration, inter-op, GIFX, <laughs> inter-agency field experimentation. Navy Postgraduate School runs that and that's a really good program. Probably for more for the lower TRL pieces. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, just a, one of the thing, our first year in development, uh, we decided to, and we were working with some unmanned systems, and they wanted to go into a Baltic Operations 2021 event. This is during a COVID environment where Germany was shut down to letting anyone in the country. And we actually got five to six cyber innovators out there on site, working with the Marines, doing their experiment. They were putting boats in the water and this was a huge success. Uh, and these programs are now going into all sorts of different ages, not just DOD, some of them co commercial. Uh, and other applications. So it was a huge success. They relied on the SEC specifically to help them navigate through the country clearance, the spectrum, and the biggest part was that we'd helped develop their data collection analysis plan, which allowed them to collect data and do reporting. We worked very close with the Marines and with the uh, companies and the providers on this and the TPOC, and it was a good success story. Next slide. How do you get a hold of us? Uh, we have our own website. We're, we're also off the Navy Cyber website. If on the left-hand side, we have a link to us. Um, on that site, we have our, our Cyber Experimentation Guide. We have a Shipwriter's Guide. Anyone going on a ship, that's a good read. And coming up, uh, two more guides coming will be our Installation Analysis Guidebook. So it should be out probably late this calendar year. Uh, my email is, is up there. Scott's and, of course, Bob Smith is our sponsor. Scott, back to you, or if there's any questions. So with that, we'll take any questions. So we'll take about a question or two, and then we're going to be switching over to the other stage. But of course, if you guys want to stay in here, you can ask as many questions as you like, and then, but the virtual audience, we will switch over to the other room too. But are there any questions? Oh, question. Uh, Cliff Colbert with Code 36 and uh, ONR Global. Can you double click on the lithium battery conversation? Or that you're having, uh, you, you mentioned that three or four times in this brief, and just curious how topical the problems that you're working on is there. Uh, so, go, go ahead, Scott, if you want to take it. No, go ahead, Chris. Right, so we've had this, uh, we were doing a fourth fleet experiment, so the lithium ion battery is a certification. Uh, the NSWC Crane is the owner of that process, and there's about a 22 cage diagram uh, guide to that. So there's all sorts of things that require storage requirements, uh, pieces and parts, just like a, like, an, like a cyber accreditation, it has its own processes now. So anything using a lithium ion battery and going on a naval vessel or an aircraft in a submarine has to go through these and even some uh, uh, site commands will require it. So there is a process and we've just completed uh, three of these processes. So we have a little bit of information on that. Okay, yeah, I'll connect with you guys offline. Curious of um, what testing parameters were established in extreme climates, uh, specifically regarding like ice paper and some of the things that are uh, we're, we're researching in the northern part of the globe. Gotcha. Yeah, we, we, had, we were in the southern part, but uh, definitely love to have that conversation with you, sir. Well, so one one trick of facilitation and doing things like this, you should at least wait eight seconds. I probably did like six or seven, but you say any questions? Okay, nope, go, good, move. No, you gotta give some time. Okay, now if you have questions, you guys know the speakers. Uh, I'm pretty sure um, uh, Mr. Christopher's email or something is somewhere, I think he put it up there. Yeah, so if you need to reach out to them for questions later, because they will come later. I always have questions later. You can ask them. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Welcome back to the global stage. It's really not a stage, but it is a stage because I'm on stage with all my bosses and my bosses are in the audience. There's Kevin Burnett, the TD for PEO MLB. I think uh, uh, Kevin Allen is out there today. Got Dave Spencer. He's my boss. Noel's my boss. 
Uh, where's where's Shannon? Raise your hand, Shannon. Shannon's my boss. Like all my bosses are here today, and they don't know I'm here, right? They're like I've been hiding for almost two weeks from doing my regular job. But here I'm really excited to um, to bring these these folks that we've heard a little bit from PEO MLB uh, earlier today, and I'll I'll filibuster as people trickle in from the other presentation. Uh, really interesting uh, that Johnny Step talked about Li2s. Uh, and how they used Agile and the approaches to Agile. Kevin, John wants to talk with you, so does Tim. And another fellow I met, Greg, wants to talk about how they think the problems of uh, workforce agility and using Agile uh, uh, can be improved. And I think that's really what you're going to talk about today, Noel, about this great product that uh, and team that, that Mr. Hubbard, PEO MLB Actual, has put together. So I'm interested in hearing that. And I'm going to turn the floor over to you, and you can use the, the red mic, and I'm going to give this mic to Dave, and you guys can tag team it away here. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Noel Schott here. Good to meet you. I'm the PAPM for Innovation Support Services under the new PEO MLB. And Dave, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Dave Spencer. I'm the tech director for ETOS and ISS, Innovation Support Services under MLB. And our brief has two parts today. The first part, I'm just gonna go over a couple introductory slides about what Innovation Support Services is all about. And you can go to the next slide. And, uh, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Dave and we're gonna do a fun improv session with you all uh, called Choose Your Own Adventure, where we're gonna walk through some of the challenges and opportunities we're facing within the PEO as we're developing new business systems. So Innovation Support Services, as you know, and you might know, PEO EIS split about a year ago. PEO MLB was formed, and that is just like Major League Baseball. It's Manpower Logistics and Business Solutions. And um, when we made this new organization, our PEO, Mr. Hubbard, knew it was really important to start developing an innovation culture. And so Innovation Support Services was stood up. And also, if you're not familiar with our PEO strategic plan, please go out to the PEO MLB website because goal number one is all about customer experience and user experience. And that's something that's at the forefront of innovation support services. The purpose of innovation support services is to be that front door to the PEO. We wanna make sure we're having a consistent conversation every time with our customers. And we'll talk a little bit about that. You know, when we think about customers, we're thinking about our entire ecosystem. Uh, we've really um, emulated the Naval X design here with Innovation Support Services. We have four service lines, engagement, navigators, workforce agility, and digital agility. And just like with Naval X, you know, the workforce agility is really important. We really want to, again, innovate that culture throughout our workforce. Think about workforce development because as we're moving into doing DevSecOps and CICD pipelines, that's a big change for a lot of government folks, you know, um, moving to agile methodology is a huge change for us as well as our functionals. Um, go on to the next slide. So with those four service lines, these are the um, offerings we have right now. And I'm sorry, you probably can't read that very well. But uh, right now we're a lean startup. Innovation Support Services will first uh, receive funding in FY22, a small budget, where we'll start bringing on people to fill out those major service lines. Um, but for right now, it's an all-volunteer workforce, and it's been a fantastic volunteer workforce across our PEO. Uh, our tech director team, we have Shannon Steg from our PMW220 ERP program. So it's been really great. A lot of people in E2S. We have our chief engineer and our product support manager, Sean Quigley and Julio Carasquia here today. So it's been amazing how people have come together to try and get this going and off the ground. Um, you know, we're doing the, the application platform guidance. So really, you know, we're adopting Microsoft 365. It's in the SecNav memo, FY22 guidance memo. So that's important to us. Um, Navigators, which I'll talk about in just a second, is all about doing quick prototypes and pilots. And um, we have a strong relationship with PEO Digital, of course, that we're still, that we're fostering every day. Um, and design thinking workshops. So going again back to that CX UX mentality, right? Starting with the users in mind and doing those design thinking workshops, that's something we can provide right now to our portfolios. And, um, and I, oh, and then with the workforce agility, if you have Star Wars fans out there, uh, we have Praxiums. Right now it's online, frequently asked questions through Teams channels, but in the future, we're hoping to move to more hands-on capabilities. At the top right, that's, going to that navigator navigator service line. And what I wanna to touch on there is one of our challenges and our opportunities at the same time is to be able to 
you know, with business systems, everybody's familiar with acquisition DODI 5000.75. That can be really slow. We spend way too much time worrying about 3,600 requirements. Switching to the software acquisition pathway, I think, is vital for all of us in software because it's agile and it's all about user experience. We want to get going right away. We don't want to spend years trying to figure out something that by the time we even start building it, it's obsolete. We've all talked about already a lot of that yesterday. So with software acquisition pathway, we're getting programs right away into the planning phase. In the planning phase of swap, you can pilot and prototype. That buys down your risk when you get into the execution phase of swap, because when you're in the execution phase, you have to deliver something within 365 days. And how long does it take to get an ATO, <laughs> right? So in pilot and prototyping, we want to do that quickly. So as soon as a customer comes to us with a new requirement or wants to modernize something, we want to jump right in. Next slide. I'm running, I'm running over, sorry. And these are two examples of uh, what Innovation Support Services has done already. And when I mention consistent conversation every time, our, our PEO is made up of Marine Corps and Navy. And so no matter what the requirement is, we have a conversation with the Navy International Program Office about a foreign military sale case management system, or the Marine Corps needs a strategic management decision support system. It's the same conversation, the same use case. We want to, you know, do our assessment, know what their requirements are, but not spend a lot of time. We want to get them in the door and get going. Um, focusing on that user, developing those use cases, those user stories, and really going to see what the user's using today, right? I want to go to the field. I want to see what that user's doing. Most importantly, what workarounds are you having to do today? And I think someone touched on that earlier in a presentation, right? What workarounds are they having to do because the current business systems don't meet their requirements, don't do what they really need to do? Next slide. And the ecosystem of partners. So this is the really big opportunity we have today as a, as a new team, why we're here this week. And we have a booth outside. And we'll be here all, all day for the networking event. So please come by and meet us. I've met a couple tech bridges today, or yesterday, I think. I met some folks. So um, I'm new to this whole innovation area. I'm previously a logistician and then got into acquisition management. So this is all new for me, but I know that this is important. This is the one thing I've learned so far, getting that ecosystem of partners um, because we want to be able to help our PEO workforce. We don't want them to have to know everything and where to go for everything. We want to help connect folks together. So I would love to meet you and, and learn what we should be doing um, to, to help. Next slide. And uh, the last thing, just, yeah, again, at our table, we have our email address, and it would be great. We're looking for people to come rotate with us. We have three-month and six-month rotations available, so any government folks, military folks that are out there that are interested, please come and contact me or grab our email address and send me an email. Um, that would be awesome. We'd love to have you. Thanks. Over to Dave. Thanks, Noel. All right. So let's start our IT acquisition adventure. This isn't too hard for some pe people in the room to imagine, but let's imagine that you're a PM of a program office and you've got a sailor readiness application and you know, your leadership thinks that it's not very great. It needs an update. And what's worse, you know they're right. You know, it's kind of hard to find people who really understand like the risk instruction set. You know, architecture is hard to, certainly hard to find Fortran developers these days, so you've got something to do. But you're not really sure where to start. You've got a whole bunch of questions. You're not an architect. You're not an IT acquisition expert. I mean, this is all new to you, right? So what do you do? There are a lot of options, and it's, it's going to get complex, but there's, it's okay, especially if you come talk to Noel, Innovation Support Services. Let's jump to the next slide. All right. So the first thing that Noelle and her crew are going to do is they're going to talk to your true need, your true, true capability need, and they're going to put it in the who, what, and why context. So you'll see, as a seaman, I want to view requirements to board my ship. So the what there and the why, so you don't get yelled at when you get there. Pretty simple, but it can get complex. Some of these are going to be in the form of epics that are going to take a long time to develop. Some of them are in the form of user stories that, that we decompose down into. This could be its own choose your own adventure itself, but we're just going to go ahead to the next slide. All right. So you can see the complexity building here. Maybe your anxiety is pulsing. Maybe, you're, maybe your heart's pumping. Maybe that's because it was just lunch. I don't know. So we've got a lot of options here, not just in tech, but in acquisition pathways and swap. We've got a one-year timeline. Uh, Noel mentioned the ATO is going to take probably about a year. Why do they make it that way? Well, we'll find out. And you know, her team will walk you through that. Let's go ahead to the next slide. 
ride. Now here's where the adventure starts and here's where I really need your help. What I want to do at the end of each slide is I want to get a vote from the audience. You know, right, like just you know, voice your concerns, you know, let, uh, voice your vote, we'll hear the preponderance. And if you're online, you know, if you can go ahead and chat, let us know which way you want to go after we're done with the slide. Uh, we'll, this is your chance to steer the ship. So let's walk through it. I'm going to break protocol and pattern. And I'm going to start with a pattern on the right side and go to the left. So let's start with, uh, we'll talk about enterprise services. We're actually supposed to start with enterprise services. That's, you know, sort of a mandate from the DOD and the DON. They want us to use those enterprise capabilities to join up, join forces, get economies of scale, all that good stuff. There are some examples. There's going to be more soon. There's some that are, you know, they're struggling along right now. We've got our friend uh, Fathom Bot over there. He's our flank speed. He's our flank speed mascot. We all love him. He's struggling, but he's going to get there. And he's actually pretty strong. All right, moving down, we've got cloud native development. This is where you're actually coding, you know, C, you know, C Sharp, Java, React Native, all that good stuff. You can do a lot there. You get, an, you get a custom bespoke capability that will definitely fit your customer's needs if you can get it done. Not easy. You pretty much need a good solid CI CD pipeline. You need good you know, container orchestration if you're going to do that. Don't worry if you don't know what all these terms mean. We can get into that later. And then there's other ways to do it too. They're cloud native function capabilities from Azure, Lambda from AWS. There's a whole bunch you can do there. All right, moving down, we've got commercial off the shelf. These are your big enterprise applications, boatloads of them out there. They're all bomb proof. They've been through millions of hours of testing. And we're going to put those on IaaS for you. IaaS, you know, in, um, infrastructure as a service. Those are your big AWSs, your Azures, your GCPs. So there's, we, have a, we have a good cadence of development there. We've pushed a lot of applications to the cloud that way. And that's definitely a path we can go down. You're gonna you're gonna get what you get, kind of. That's again, it's COTS, it's commercial off the shelf. You can you you can um, you configure them a bit, but you're gonna kind of get what you get. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not good for your customers, and we'll help walk you through that. All right, moving over to the left, we've got low no code platforms. And there's a couple different ways we can deliver these to you, and there's a, a bunch of different flavors out there, a bunch of different competitors in the marketplace, and they're all great. This is where you can get a bespoke capability but you don't necessarily have to hire somebody with a computer science degree to, to do it, right? You don't have to get a bunch of a team of coders from a boot camp or whatever. So there's a lot to be said for this pattern too, and you can really, you can uh, accelerate your development that way. And then up at the top, true to my heart, we've, we've had a whole bunch of success on this. Um, we, we've, we've piloted this, not to mention we've got M365 now as an enterprise service. We've got your commercial SaaS software as a service. So these are the not quite turnkey solutions, um, and this is the, definitely the pattern that industry likes the best. And there's millions of them out there. There's some that are available to us now. Uh, you have to get a, you have to go to DISA and get a provisional authorization just to buy the thing. We can get all of that in the future. But for now, having heard that and knowing a little bit about the application that we that we're trying to develop, which pattern do you all want to follow? SAS, SAS, we. I think we hear SAS, it's a resounding, yeah, that's a unanimous vote. Okay, so good news, your SAS application just happens to be on an enterprise contract. It's already rocking and ready to go. Great, right? Bad news, oh yeah, so there's these things called brokers in the Navy, and they have, for, you know, they have NTAs, Navy technical agents underneath them. There aren't any that want to broker your particular SAS. They're all just, they're too consumed with it right now. Like they've got their own IaaS problems. They've got, a, they've got contract problems. There's just too much work. So they're just not ready. Maybe next year, maybe the year after, but that's, that's way too late for you. What do you do? What you do is you go to the CSMO, the Cloud Service Management Office, used to be called NCCS, PMW 270 over at PEO Digital. Talk to them. This has actually happened. We did this for a SaaS application that we uh, ended up brokering ourselves through a, through a Navy standalone, uh, NTA standalone agreement. So we have a choice. We can either go back and just choose another pattern and forget all about SaaS, you know, maybe try to succeed some other way, or we can go ahead and broker it ourselves. What do you want to do? Are we going to broker it ourselves? Stand alone. All right, let's do it. All right. So remember I said it's kind of almost a turnkey solution? Eh, almost. So uh, SaaS has an identity crisis. Think about it. This is a commercial, this is a commercial product. They don't know who we are. They certainly don't know who all our users are. We probably wouldn't want these commercial entities to know who every one of our uniformed military folks are, all of our civilians, and they don't want to have that responsibility. So the first question I always get when I start, try, start to integrate with, an, with a SaaS provider is, hey, where's your identity provider? Who's that? Who do we go to? So we've got to answer that question. We could 
good with a brand new, I'm really excited about this, but it's new. And this actually, this, this is the part that's actually breaking a little bit of news maybe for some folks in green there. Naval Identity Services in fiscal year 22 is going to offer identity provision amongst other things. Um, but it's new, it's an enterprise service, all kinds of things can happen, can go sideways, you never know. Well, and all, also, remember, remember that really complicated five different patterns? You know, we chose one and now we gotta have, we have an enterprise service, now we've got two patterns. And so the smartest, you know, like the, you know, we got the smartest uh, Ghostbuster over here, tell Egon, telling you not to do it, don't cross those patterns. What do you do, do you wanna, you wanna follow Egon's advice, don't cross the patterns, or do you wanna go enterprise? We gonna cross the streams? We're crossing the streams. All right, enterprise, enterprise, let's do it. Oh, Egon was wrong, you were a success. In three months, he got it done. You built on a SaaS application that had a PA that you could inherit from. Naval Identity Services, I didn't get into this, you could inherit from that. My cyber bubba's out in the room, will know all about the AC controls, be nice to get those off your plate. And guess what? The reason, the reason you were successful and successful so quickly is because your vendor kind of did it already for you. And where your vendor had a gap, the enterprise service had filled that gap. So that was why you had a success. So let's go ahead and hit that success button and let's celebrate a little bit. So we made it, we actually did it on the first try, guys. Seriously, a round of applause for you all. All right. All right, so um, we can definitely come back to this slide. I don't know what, how we're doing on time. But um, let me go ahead and get to the take home. Um, actually, how, how are we doing on time? Four, oh, we got 14 minutes. Okay, we'll do this again. We'll, I think we'll be back here again. Let's go back to the beginning. If you could just go back several to those patterns. Meanwhile, everybody gets a little bit of a preview. Go back at two, yeah, there you go, right on. Okay, so we, did, we went down the SAS pattern. We've, I think we've exhausted that one pretty well. Which, what is the next pattern you all want to choose? Low, no code. I hear low, no code. All right, I like it. Let's do low, no code. So again, you, there's a theme here. You've got a lot of options. Not only do you have a bunch of different competitors for that are listed here for legal folks out there. These are just examples. We're not picking them. We're not even going to pick. Uh, we're not even going to talk about which one we picked. You know, no favoritism here for sure. But so we've got four vendors that are out there right now that we can that we know we can avail ourselves of. There may be more. We may have missed some. Who knows? We've got two deployment models. We can talk about that in a minute. We certainly will. And then we've got like tenancy models. What is that? So we can walk through all that. Now the good. Now let's just go ahead and say you picked one. We won't say which. You lucked out. It ha it has a PaaS offering, a platform as a service offering. We can you can see that here. It's um it's outlined in yellow. What that means, that's the application stack. So basically, you know, it's kind of like SaaS, but you actually have to you know, be responsible for the application itself as well as the data and the people that we talked about over in SaaS. So, it's, so this low no code platforms, PaaS offering has a DISA provisional authorization that you can inherit from much like, not, not quite like, but much like the SaaS application that we just had some success with. So that's great. Let's go ahead and hit next. All right, we have another challenge. You know, this one, remember I said, you don't need a computer science degree to, to be successful here. You don't need to have gone to a cyber boot camp or a coding boot camp, all right? But you got two choices. You've got quick access, really easy access, to a team that's a little bit green. You're not really sure about them. They might be successful, you never know. They make a lot of good promises. Or you can wait three months. I don't know, which one do you all wanna do? You want it quick, let's hit it quick. Oh, we might come back to this, uh, this slide again, depending on the choices you all make, but that's okay. So we, we decided that we wanted to go with those citizen developers and maybe that wasn't quite the right name for them. It's not quite citizens. Maybe we need a little bit of a step above the, you know, the, the hoi polloi. So um, I think we'd probably need to go back and choose another pattern. All right. So we could continue to go down the low no-code path and choose some other options, or we could choose one of the other three patterns. What does everybody want to do? I hear COTS on IaaS. Well, yeah, it's all right, let's COTS on IaaS, let's do it. All right, which cloud are you gonna ride on? So you've chosen a great enterprise platform or enterprise application. That enterprise application has to be installed someplace. 
you got your Azure's, your AWS's, your your uh, your GCPs. They, those have to have a PA too, and we can get into all, what all that means. It's a little bit. It's quite a bit different than the SaaS and PaaS PAs. So. What are you going to do? You go to cloud.navy.mil, you make some choices, you figure out what's there. Every now and again, there's some stuff there that's not up to date. And so that's where our vendor relationships come in. That's where our relationships with our service providers and the DOD come in. All right. But that's good. Like you're on a good path, you're on a good platform. So let's go ahead and hit next. So for the nexus of cloud news nerds and Star Wars fans, y'all might get the joke. So this is a bit of a bummer. Um, your cloud contract got canceled. Well, you could wait for the next big thing. I think they're calling it JWCC, Joint Warfare Cloud Capability, whatever it is. Or you could go back and choose another pattern. What does everybody want to do? We want to choose another pattern. Let's go back. All right. Which way do we want to go? I think on this one, um, if I can steer the ship myself for a moment, let's go back to low no code. I think that looks that deserves another look. Yes, indeed. All right, so we're at low no code. We've got a we've got a PaaS offering. This is good stuff. You know, we're we're on a firm footing. We're gonna hit next. And you know, uh, well, we went back to that developer team and we kind of kicked them to the curb. We you know we talked to the core. We did everything we had to do. You know, we followed all the rules. And then we waited and we spent some more time and we figured out we'd, we'd get a better team available to us here, right? So we've got them on contract now. Let's go ahead and wait a while. Congrats, you win. All right, we, we got there, we had a solid team. Yeah, I mean, we know it's low and no code. And again, these are like kind of squishy terms in industry, people kind of chuckle when they talk about them, but it's a really solid platform. It's a really good way to do things. It didn't take you that long. The key thing here is with these low no code platforms, your customers can kind of get whatever they want. That can get you into trouble sometimes. You know, you can go down a path that'll, that'll get you into some technical debt. You're almost certainly gonna be locked into a particular vendor, but that, sometimes that's okay, at least for a while. And, you know, we can talk about that in the future. But, it, but you made this an absolute success. Your customers are happy. And when they're not happy, you can tighten that feedback loop and you can show them something in that low no-code platform that's going to impress them in a way that they didn't before. And most of these low no-code platforms are gonna have application performance monitoring built in. So this is a really solid way to go. Let's go ahead and hit that success button. All right, so what are the take home points here today? Can you uh, hit the success button? There you go, right on. All right, so you made it, you got to the end. Most important thing, let's make sure that you, that you go back and do this faster, better, and in your own program office. I really want to see you all be successful. Please come to Innovation Support Services to guide you and help you out. What are our take home points here? This is complex. It's not easy. These are not just technically complex. It's complex from a process standpoint, from a policy standpoint. There's a lot to, there's a lot of layers to peel back here. But we think that you can be successful and we can help. We've got, we in Innovation Support Services have relationships that can help you. We've got expertise that can help you. But ultimately, I mean, there's a reason why we made this a choose your own adventure. It wasn't just because we, would knew, we knew that we were doing this after lunch. And we wanted you know, people to start thinking more and you know, have the insulin spike down a little bit. We also wanted to make sure that you knew that this is your ship. You know, we'll help you get there. We'll help you navigate. We actually have, like, you know, you know, Noel mentioned that we've got navigators as an entire line of effort under innovation support services. But these are your choices, and that's why I, it was very important for me and for Noel, for you all to have a vote and have a say and have a voice. So this is your ship that we will help you steer. All right. Um, so we'll, another key thing, you're going to notice a theme in all these slides, and we can share these after, is that speed is absolutely the, the core of, what, of value, not just in the value of the capabilities that you're going to put into the hands of the warfighters and your customers, but also think about it. I get this I get this pushback all the time. We've got this legacy app, you know, it's in the data center. You want me to go to the cloud, great. I'm going to be paying for that legacy uh, that legacy application support in that data center every single day we're going to the cloud. And so the faster that we can get you to the cloud, the less time you're going to spend supporting two separate systems. All right. And most important of all, and this will lead us into the next slide, come to the booth tomorrow. You know, talk to Noel. Talk to to the MLB team. I'll be there too. If you could go to that last slide. That last slide is gonna have our um, is gonna have our contact information. That's right. All right. Does anybody have any questions? 
We got six minutes left. Yes, ma'am. The identity, the identity services that you spoke of, is that just for Navy or does that also include Marines as well? Will that be available to the Marine Corps? Yes, it's uh, it's Naval identity services. So it's Marine Corps as well. Absolutely. Good question. So if, if you have any software that's coming in and they're not sure we send them your way, that's 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 going to contracting <clears throat> for the Navy before you have an O&R or whoever. Whichever office is, we send them the company to you guys. If you're industry and you'd like to talk to PEO MLB, yeah, you could definitely contact us at this email address and we'll send up set up capability briefings. Uh, because the one thing I forgot to mention earlier is with the PEO MLB reorg, we've gone to a service delivery model. So Right now, you know, we have Navy RP, the financial system. We have My Navy HR, HR systems, training systems. Um, I'm, you know, but what we want to get to is service delivery. And that's another one of our challenges and opportunities so that when new requirements come in, like I mentioned, Navy International Program Office or a Marine Corps system that wants to do strategic management support, we want to look across our PEO of systems first. And, um, and so definitely we're always looking at industry capabilities, but we don't want to stay in our silos anymore. So that's one area that we really want uh, feedback on. Great question. Any other questions from the audience? I'll follow Ashley's advice. Five, four. Did, did we wait our eight seconds like Ashley said? Now we did. Now we did? <clears throat> So, Noel, Dave, thanks a lot for coming out. I, I hope everyone enjoyed this presentation. It's super important. This is what Mr. Hubbard has, has put within his PEO to make a difference. It might be a two millimeter difference, remember, three millimeter, whatever it is. But with, with this hot shot team uh, and, and, and Ken Allen's leadership, uh, or Ken Allen, right? Kevin Allen. Kevin Allen. Kevin. Raise your hand, Kevin. So. Kevin Allen, I, I beg your pardon. Well, with his leadership, we should make a definite difference. So thank you very much. All right, we're ending a little early, so I'm going to use the uh, link if I can use the time uh, just to talk about a couple of things. Uh, you know how I like to talk. So we do have uh, a lot of MLB people here today. So MLB manpower logistics business solutions they have a, a, a stand outside there they're here to talk with work the workforce and also uh, uh industry base take your time to go talk with them there's something else i wanted to mention today oh let's see i don't remember i had it in my... okay so <clears throat> i think we're just gonna move people over uh, to the next presentation. Ashley's going to be introducing uh, over there on the summit stage our 1400 uh, meeting. So uh, if we can start making our way over there, I appreciate it. Oh, the other thing I was going to mention, water. There's plenty of water out, so please don't dehydrate today. It seems to be a little cooler in here, but uh, keep pumping water down into your system. The Marines are putting water out for us, so uh, be sure to thank them.
Summit stage, everybody. So my speaker who's coming up next is completely virtual. This is what you get, like reading is very fundamental. And I didn't realize my speaker and I was yelling out in the room. I was like, where's my speaker? Oh, he's virtual. Uh, so introducing next, Dr. Ryan Mackison, uh, leveraging the Defense Technology, uh, sorry, Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, to advance the DOD research enterprise. Dr. Mackison, are you there? Oh, I see him coming. Oh, can you turn your mic on? If you talk, mic check, mic check. I think I was uh, muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you so much. I was going to give you a presentation if you weren't there, and I was just going to guess my way through it. I'm really good at that. <laughs> thank, well, thank you. you. And um, can you also see my uh, first slide here? Yes, we can. All right, great. I'm um, glad we're up and running here. And again, thanks for having me um, today. I'm really excited to come and um, tell you about the great work that we're doing at, at DTEC. Um, if you have not heard of us before, I will start out today with a generic overview of what we do as a DOD organization. And then I'll go into a little bit further about the individual tools that we have available to uh, both uh, industry and DOD researchers that will hopefully allow you to really leverage to get the most out of the dollars that the DOD invests in s and scientific information research each year. So, so um, if you haven't heard of us, um, DTEC, I'm going to start out with a little bit of history. We've been around for 75 years, and um, we were really born in the aftermath of World War II. At the time, the Allied forces, which were sweeping across Europe, were coming across a number of documents, uh, research documents that had been generated from uh, German researchers. These documents were inherently valuable, um, especially to future efforts going into the Cold War. So it was decided that we needed a good place to have all this information collected and available to the research enterprise in the U.S. So it was it decided that um, yeah, we were going to stand up an organization, um, eventually it would be called DTEC. And fast forwarding 75 years later, our, our mission has really um, remained the same. Um, overall, we are here to both um, collect technical information, research reports, um, uh, ongoing research summaries, um, but we also want to make sure that that information is disseminated widely across the DOD and to um, some extent the public and industry. Um, we also have another um, main point is we provide analysis services. We have a whole uh, research uh, team with, through our, in, individual, our information analysis centers which can help you take the, uh, the copious amounts of um, technical information that the DOD has been generating over the past um, 100 years plus and put it to the best use. Um, overall, the department, as I mentioned, we spend a, a lot of money on S&T, and we're here to help leverage and get the most value out of that money as we possibly can. Ultimately, it's not any good uh, for advancing the warfighter's mission if it just sits in a lab. We want to make sure that that information is communicated, but at the same time, we do have controls on the, uh, the on certain levels um, that will hopefully prevent the uh, the information that we are generating from entering to the wrong hands. So we have three main areas of focus. Um, first of all, is content management, collecting and um, technical reports. We have over uh, 4.7 million. Uh, technical documents and research project data. If you count other forms of information that we house, it's way above this. The other main focus is user services. Beyond collecting information, we also provide uh, platforms for individuals to communicate to one another in a secure environment, whether it's a classified or controlled unclassified um, areas. We want to make sure that um, people can communicate across different agencies, uh, both across the DOD and other executive branches. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we also provide um, information analysis centers, which provide additional expertise in order to um, take information. They can analyze it. They can do contractual research. And they're there to help support any kind of technical questions you, you might have. So um, unlike other uh, repositories that are out there, 
we, we are in three different levels. Our first level is public, which is contains a large number of s and reports, is fully available to anyone who wants to go out there and see it. Um, but I would say the bulk of our content is really held on Nippernet or Sippernet, or information that's uh, controlled, unclassified, or classified. And this is where we get into a lot of specialized tools that we ha have in-house that can help you search through uh, information the DoD has been generating and be able to find um, the information you want quickly and to make sense of it and to gain insights that you might other might not otherwise be able to gain. So I'll go into these different port, um, classifications a little bit more detail later on though. Um, in terms of our public, as I mentioned, um, we often, uh, we, these are our overall um, products and services that we offer. Um, I'm not gonna go in great detail on all of these because there are a lot of them. Um, but overall, we have our basic search for finding technical information, special search engine for um, uh, journal articles through Pub Defense. We have a search engine, again, for grant awards. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, the information analysis centers. And I'll go on later to talk in more detail about our uh, defense innovation marketplace. It's really the place for uh, DOD and industry to uh, connect. And then also, lastly, I should mention, we also hold NDIA conference proceeding papers, uh, the ones that are available to the public. But to get to our, um, our SIPR and NIPR site, um, our information that is at the controlled or controlled and classified level um, has to be protected in some manner. And the way that we protect it is through the use of a credential card. Uh, most uh, common across the DOD is the CAT card, the CAC. Um, but many in the industry can also hopefully be able to obtain um, a PIV or an ECA card. So whenever you go and want to get into our SIPR, uh, SIPR and Nibernet site, you'll go and insert your, your card. The card reader will um, communicate at what level of information you, you are um, qualified to access. And this is how certain documents are either made available or not available according to um, each individual case. So if you're interested in finding more information about how to obtain one of these cards, um, here's some basic resources um, that are available. Um, also, you can also reach out uh, to us and we can provide guidance, but overall, um, these are the um, uh, requirements for getting into our site. So um, once you do log in, uh, when you log in for the first time, you'll be required to register. It takes just two minutes. And then you'll enter to a, um, a, what we call the r &E gateway, the uh, site um, page, which contains a list of all the different products and services um, that we have. In terms of um, uh, the ability to search through technical information, um, this is just um, a a few, it would be the majority of the search engines that we have um, for finding technical information. Our bread and butter, um, is, I would say, is our DOD uh, s and report search. It, I'll um, go over this here a little bit further. But beyond that, we have specialized search engines for, for example, international agreements, um, IR&D, um, a government portal. We have a separate one for searching through DOD data sets to find uh, data that uh, has been generated that you can uh, hopefully connect with others who are the product, who are the owners of it. We have information on acquisition um, repositories, um, uh, SBIRs and STTRs uh, with um, the information uh, innovator information repository. We have a um, in-person combatant command classified reading room for finding um, requirements. Um, that are established by the combatant commands at the classified level. And then we have specialized pages to look through the modernization priority areas, uh, which really highlight um, a lot of the, um, well, obviously priorities of the DOD for modernization. But going beyond searching for technical reports, uh, we do offer, uh, offer other um, services. Uh, for example, I'll talk a little bit further about DTEC's own uh, journal, the Journal of DOD Research and Engineering. We have um, smart tools for that uses uh, natural language processing for analyzing uh, large amounts of data and summarizing it for you. We have a specialized search engine called Horizons that covers um, both uh, mostly funding information, both in the past and the, that is current in Congress. Uh, we have DTEC trainings and as well as other platforms that allow individuals to communicate to each other. 
Um, one is called DOD Techopedia, and the second one is Defense Communities. So this is just a quick listing of a number of products and services that we offer. I'll go into a little more detail uh, later on on some of them of these um, in here in a few minutes. But the other side of DTEC is um, not involved in uh, the search of documents, but it is also important that we receive information. We get information from a large number of sources, some of which is authors and organizations submitting directly to us. Some of it's going out and crawling the web for information and others are through agreements that we have with other organizations. Um, overall, um, we want to collect and be that central repository for technical information. And that means that oh, if you are an author and you are generating technical information and this information is funded by the Department of Defense, it really should be uh, submitted to us so that we can be the, the um, stewards of this information long term. We want to make sure that it's safeguarded from um, so that it's not uh, being um, disseminated inappropriately. We want to avoid duplication of research efforts. We want to make sure that if someone in the Navy is um, working on the same project as someone in the Army, um, we want to make sure that that it, we can avoid that duplication and use of resources. We want to make sure that your research um, is also receiving um, a high level of visibility. Um, communication and sharing is really important to innovation. And of course, um, we want to do all this and to ultimately advance our capabilities um, for the warfighter. So while sharing is good for um, the actual uh, scientific enterprise, there are also the policy side of this. Um, I'm not a policy expert, but uh, listed here are just a few of the requirements that do dictate that uh, final technical reports or interim technical information of various different kinds um, are submitted to DTEC um, and housed by us. Um, if you have more questions about the uh, these uh, different policies, I'm happy to go through them in more detail with our policy expert. But most important is that we wanna make sure that this, the information is shared appropriately, is collected, preserved, and to make sure that um, uh, every organization is in full compliance with these policies and regulations. So um, in addition to um, having collecting this information, so what do we collect? Um, this is just a, a snapshot of the different types of documents um, that go beyond technical reports, things such as journal offer, uh, articles, conference proceeding papers, grant awards, dissertations, thesis, um, metadata on data sets. Um, I should also mention that we um, go all the way up to secret level, but we don't hold anything at the top secret. Um, and if you're uh, also familiar of distribution levels, uh, we do hold all the way up to distribution F. So that's another kind of snapshot of what we collect, but also what you can find by going into our databases. Um, so going back to um, going into the r &E gateway, um, this is our uh, basic search available on uh, Nippernet or controlled or classified level. Uh, but I recommend whenever you go into the, the site, go to advanced search. And this is where you can uh, find any topic of information um, that you might be interested. But we also offer abilities to search according to uh, various different topics, such as uh, collections of categories, modernization priority areas, budgeting information, such as R2s and P40s, classification levels, um, so on and so forth. So this is usually um, we, where most people spend their time is going through and searching through the data. But if you uh, want to go further um, beyond this, the search engine, we do offer other uh, search tools, um, one of which is the pub, what we call Pub Defense. Now, this is a, um, a database which contains pu publicly available journal articles. Um, however, there is oftentimes a, um, an embargo on uh, journal articles for the first 12 months uh, and that you would not be able to obtain these articles without first being able to um, have a subscription to a certain uh, magazine. Um, but this is, uh, uh, once into our system, these articles can become available um, to DOD um, uh, individuals. The other thing I like to highlight with Pub Defense is uh, we also highlight um, data sets that are attached to a journal article. So 
you can go through and you can read, read the results of a certain uh, research project, uh, but you can also follow the link and go to outside resources to either download directly um, the data that was evolved in the research or find the, um, the POC contact information uh, for the stewards of that information, which I think is a really great tool for uh, being able to dive down and go deeper into um, the actual uh, work that folks have been doing. Um, also, I should mention that uh, in addition to our database on journal articles, uh, DTEC has recently established its own independent uh, journal uh, called the Journal of DoD Research and in Engineering. Now, this one is um, uh, different than all other journals out there in that uh, this one only publishes information at the controlled and the controlled unclassified level of the secret distribution uh, E. Um, this was uh, really identified as a, uh, a weakness um, by um, a few years ago by not allowing individuals who work on controlled research the inability to publish. Obviously, you can't publish controlled or classified research in public journal articles. So this uh, journal was established to meet that need. It also is really important to us that um, whether you're working on controlled or classified information, that it goes through a peer, re vetting, peer review vetting process, that only the best information um, out there is actually reaching the most um, folks out there. In terms of um, the subject matter of um, the journal, it's multidisciplinary in nature, as long as it has um, a clear thread related to um, research topics by the DOD, um, we would consider it for publication. Um, we do about four um, editions per year, and we also uh, publish special editions. Uh, recently, we've had special editions on hypersonics, microelectronics, and uh, additive manufacturing of explosives, as, along with other subjects. Um, also, just like any other journal, um, the vast majority of our peer reviewers have doctoral degrees to be a peer reviewer. Um, you must also be a, a DOD active duty or civilian. And if you're interested in um, being a peer reviewer, uh, we, I do encourage you to, to reach out. Uh, we need three peer reviewers for every journal article we receive, and we receive a lot of journal articles. Um, so if you are interested, please feel free to take down this uh, contact information uh, located here. Or if you're interested in submitting an article that um, you would that has controlled or controlled and classified information, um, these are the links that you can also uh, follow as well. Um, so going into some of our other uh, products and services, I did mention that we have tools available to allow individuals to collaborate, one of which is called DoD Techopedia. This is a Wikipedia that um, it is able to hold information at distribution C. You can create your own pages uh, for individual groups to share information, make postings, um, make announcements. Um, you can also go here to learn information about certain DOD topics. Uh, for example, here I, have, I pulled um, information from um, a page that was generated on the uh, Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division from China Lake. It has general information about the organization's links, and we're also working on adding information on their actual submissions to DTEC over time. Um, another uh, feature product that we offer is Horizons. Now, Horizons is all about um, looking through funding and DOD investment, both in the past and upcoming. Horizons is, div is uh, divided into four different sections. The first section is the place where you can go to look through um, individual records, such as R2s, P40s, grant awards, um, uh, URED records, or research and progress summaries. This is where you can go into a lot of detail on um, the actual records themselves. Explore and Analyze, on the other hand, um, well, Explore allows you to look at a little higher up level. It takes information, it um, graphs it out for you, it allows you to see trends, and then you can delve, diver, uh, delve further into the actual documents themselves uh, through um, actual search. Analyze mostly focuses on con the congressional budget and uh, reference is this background tools on uh, information that can be of assistance, allow you to hopefully become um, better at finding the information that you uh, are seeking. So going beyond just offering the actual uh, documents themselves, as I mentioned, 
um, the search engines provide additional tools such as um, visualizations that allow you to um, gain insight that you might not otherwise be able to uh, garner by just searching through documents per se. Um, for example, on the top left-hand side here, um, it were uh, automatically generated charts um, for uh, Navy um, uh, funding over the past few years, and it breaks it down into different um, priority areas if you so want to, or breaking down by keywords. On the um, right-hand side are also uh, different ways to look at funding allocation. Um, this is pulled from uh, Navy and looking at pro both program element and, and, uh, and specifically um, geared towards a 6.2 applied research. So you can see what kind of chunk each uh, different research program is, is taking in the department. You can also look at information um, according to uh, appropriations, um, um, according to 6.1 through 6.7 research. And that we also have advanced tools that allow you to um, go through the congressional process of funding, going all the way from the president's um, budget request to the final appropriation. You can see how the markups of each committee um, goes up or down. So you can gain uh, a general awareness of where the cuts might be, where the, what programs are getting um, uh, in, a bump in funding. And following the links in these tools, you can hopefully develop down further into different resources that allow you to uh, make wise uh, financial decisions and investments. Uh, the other place you can find information on, on funding is DUD Grants Awards. This one is um, publicly available and it does offer a both uh, ability to search through information according to a number of criteria such as financial year, uh, funding agency, and start dates, points of contacts. This is a great place to search through uh, information if you are looking for uh, obtaining a DOD grant. Uh, the other tool I'd really like to um, uh, highlight here is our uh, Defense Innovation Marketplace, which DTEX hosts on our site. Now, the Defense Innovation Marketplace is partly public, partly uh, behind different firewalls within DTEC, but it's meant to be a great place and resources for industry, specifically small business industry, to uh, find opportunities to do business with the DOD government. Here you can find information on um, strategic documents of, for guidance, um, information on different news and events and different um, technology needs. You can find publicly available um, um, solicitations from the combatant commands. Um, there's a lot here. And if you haven't had a chance, I do encourage you to come and just basically sort through on the different um, search engines and different portals that are available um, to really see if you can find information related to um, doing a re business with industry. Um, one tool that you can find within the Defense Innovation Marketplace that is linked to it is uh, what we call the, the Innovators Information Repository or IIR. This is our, our search engine for searching through all of the SBIRs and STTRs um, um, within the DOD. But going beyond just searching for these according to a different topic, it also includes a large amount of information about individual companies who have done research um, projects with uh, the government um, previously. And with those companies, we have information according to points of contact, what their capabilities are, and some of their previous um, contract information that they have done um, in the past. The other thing I like about this is it also shows you uh, certain features such as uh, location. You can search through and to see who's doing a certain research topic uh, um, by state, and it can allow you to hopefully find collaborators that might be nearby you, which you were not otherwise familiar with. So this is a great tool, um, especially for um, small businesses to really find uh, those connections out there. Um, lastly, I'd like to just, um, again, uh, talk briefly about the uh, information analysis centers. This is really our research uh, arm of DTEC. And what they do is they are um, here to provide um, a quality um, contract methods to um, allow individuals to quickly get to uh, the research that they need to conduct it. They can also perform uh, technical inquiries. Um, they'll do a, a technical query. You come up with a question and they'll do a literary search for you up to four hours for free. If you wanna go beyond the four hours to go even further and for literature searches, um, it's at a relatively uh, nominal cost. 
and they have we have three different IACs under our belt. Um, each one is devoted to a specific um, domain: cybersecurity, defense systems, and homeland defense. They also I should also mention that they do also host a number of events. They put on podcasts and different trainings. They put out state of the um, uh, art. Uh, field reports, which uh, covers the information um, and does a complete evaluation of a certain field where the technical information is evolving to, what's the current status, um, as well as other uh, services that we can certainly go into further detail on. Um, so overall, um, what I really want you to go away with is an understanding that DTEC is a central repository for technical information we really uh, should and can be involved at every step of the research and engineering cycle. Um, this is just a quick um, infographic that you can take home with you to think about how does DTEC play a role, everything from coming up with a research question with doing literary searches, searching for funding information, um, seeing if there's duplications of research efforts out there, all the way to submitting to us interim research reports to final technical reports, as well as um, making sure that we have information on the data that was actually generated. Ultimately, feeding back into our repository where we house and collect the information to make available to other people who will then turn uh, be able to have more insight in developing quality questions that will eventually um, be of a benefit to the warfighters min uh, mission. Um, so with that, I'd just like to um, say that we're always here and happy to help. We're a service organization. Um, we're, uh, almost everything we do is free. It's just usually a matter of um, making sure that we have the proper credentials uh, for you to be able to view certain documents. Uh, but if you do have um, more questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, many times I do these briefings and I can do uh, an overview of what we do. But um, in more um, controlled settings, we can actually delve further into technical information generated from the uh, information that we have on hand. Um, and with that, I think I am, uh, have four minutes left for questions if anyone is, is interested. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, are there any questions here in the audience? I'm scanning, I'm scanning. Oh, got a question? Yep. I do have one. Uh, is there a repository in, in DTEC for uh, TTPs? I'm not actually very familiar with TTPs. Um, is there another term for those documents? Sorry, what did you say? What'd you say, Ryan? Oh, um, I do, I'm not familiar with TTPs. Is there any other term? for those and types of documents? Tactics, techniques, and procedures? Um, possibly. We have field guides uh, out there, uh, which w might be uh, similar to those. Um, overall, I do did talk mostly about technical reports, but there are other different types of documents that we do ha have in our basic search engine, uh, which may fall under TTPs. Thank you. Got time for about one more question before we switch to the stage. Ryan's contact information is on the screen. And um, if you guys have any more questions after this, you can always send it to Ryan and he'll get that answered for you. All right. Um, just want to make mention again, um, right about now in the, in the machine shop, which is on the other side, they will be doing uh, Marine Makers uh, demonstrations. And don't forget to check out the Marines actually doing, um, uh, making an autonomous robot in four days to carry their equipment of like up to 100 pounds. Just teaching Marines, there's eight of them from literally all over the country, and they'll be able to, um, you know, like just learn innovation out in the field to be able to do that like literally like tomorrow. So check that out. All right, thank you.
global stage. So we've got two great people to talk to us about the Aviation Alliance. Now we've got Cassie, who on the map here is from Orlando, Florida, which is our, what, what is that one called? That's the Central Florida Tech Bridge. And then we've got my dear friend, who I love so much, Rick Tarr, the King of Pias. I think I heard I Ashley call you yesterday like the King of Pias. But there's other T2s here that can help you. So I just met the, the Orta from, uh, from Keyport. Ty, I think is his name. I just met. So there's Ortas and T2s everywhere. So Don Workforce people, be sure to pull those folks aside and talk with them. So Southern Maryland, is that where your tech bridge is? And you're going to talk about the Avi Aviation Alliance. I am so interested in what this is going to be. So folks, I'm going to turn you over to Cassie and Rick is going to be uh, her partner in crime. I'll put the microphone on this side. Cassie, it's all yours. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. We are really excited to talk about the new TechBridge Aviation Alliance uh, slide. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Tech bridges in general, we'll kind of start with the basic. Uh, tech bridges are a line of effort under Naval X. Uh, we are this integrated network that you see all the way across the map here that we are going out um, helping the Navy be more innovative. Innovative. We are partnering with industry, academia, um, doing great things to make the Navy better. So if we go to the next slide, so if the tech bridges are so great, why do we need an alliance? Well, there are certain rules that come with uh, becoming a tech bridge. Not anybody within the Navy can be a tech bridge. Uh, you need to be aligned with the Warfare Center, a federal lab, because that allows you to then um, create these partnership agreements. So that's great. We have a lot of big brains in our organizations. The tech bridges have done amazing things so far, but we felt like you know, we might be missing the voice of the warfighter. So with this alliance, we are now able to bring in organizations with a fleet concentration that can now leverage that tech bridge network, even though they previously were not qualified to be part of that network. So the next reason is to address the community-wide challenges. So these alliances are formed around similar mission sets. Uh, oftentimes, we have, we're have we all dealing with the same pain points, and we're addressing them at the level that we can. So oftentimes, we are kind of reinventing the wheel. We are solving the same problems over and over again. This alliance allows us to start working together. We can start addressing cross-cutting problems across our entire community, as well as um, have that communication. So if we know that somebody over here has figured out the answer to this problem, we can go implement that across the entire community rather than, again, everybody creating the wheel over and over again. And the last reason why we should have an alliance within the TechBridge network is creating that ecosystem of innovation. Uh, like I said, with the TechBridge network, we've kind of already got that mindset. But again, let's get that mindset into the warfighter. Let's start Navy-wide creating that culture of innovation. Um, so with them now allowed to be part of the culture that we're building, we're furthering that. So if we go to the next slide. So now that we realize, hey, this is a great idea. So what is what does this thing look like? Um, so first of all, you need to start with at least one established tech bridge. So like I mentioned before, that kind of gives you uh, the keys to the kingdom as far as now you can start writing partnership agreements and it gives you access to the rest of that network. These established tech bridges, they have um, these existing relationships that you can part to um, start to leverage. Um, there's no limitation on the number of tech bridges that can be part of an alliance. If you are in a related field, you can be part of an alliance. Uh, the next thing that you need is a naval organization with a fleet concentration. Again, bringing that voice of the warfighter uh, to the alliance and to the tech bridge network. And the last thing that you'll need, um, just like the regular text bridges, you'll need a PIA partner, um, someone that can kind of be that liaison within that 
that community and really get after some of those local initiatives. Uh, so like I mentioned previously, so now that you have all of your players um, in place, well, what what is this around? Is this um, regional? No, it's about you have to have the same mission set. So we're going to go into our, our example here in a minute. So we have started an aviation alliance. So membership in that, everybody needs to be part of the aviation community. Doesn't matter where in the country, where in the world your unit may be located, you need to be part of the aviation community to be part of an aviation alliance. The thing, if we go to the next slide, um, I spoke about this a little bit, but just here are the roles. Everybody brings something to the table. Why does everybody have to be part of this? Um, like I had mentioned previously, the, the tech bridges, most of us have been around for a while, so they're kind of uh, guiding things along. They can create those partnership agreements uh, that are valuable to then the rest of the alliance. Uh, again, that network. Um, Rick knows people that I don't know, and I know people that Rick know doesn't know. And those uh, fleet concentrations doesn't know any of the people that we know. So um, it, it's widening our network. We're now able to, um, because we're doing so much with academia, industry, we may know a little bit more what's out there, and we can then get that to the warfighter faster, getting that feedback loop from them on what's actually important. I might think something is cool, but... The folks using it day to day may tell me, you know what, I really don't need that. Um, so, and that's that's part of what that Navy Aviation Alliance member brings in. Um, they're bringing that perspective, that feedback. But then again, we're also hoping to start sourcing problems from them. What are the actual pain points? What do you care about? What's eating your lunch every day? As well as that unique perspective. Um, we do have those conversations already with the tech bridges, but sometimes we're looking at these problems from the viewpoint of um, the warfare centers. Like we have these amazing scientists, engineers, really smart people, but they may ha bring a different perspective than the warfighter will. So we want to work together to have all of those perspectives to create a more holistic uh, solution to some of these challenges that we're having. Our final player is that local alliance lead. So they are the ones um, that are kind of that liaison between the Navy organizations and that local community dealing with uh, academia, industry within their um, sphere of influence and just empowering what's going on there in the local ecosystem. So now that we've talked about what is in general this formula that we've created for an alliance, let's talk a little bit about the Aviation Alliance. So as of right now, there are uh, three members. Uh, the Central Florida Tech Bridge, which is aligned with Naval Air Warfare Center Training Systems Division. Rick's Tech Bridge, the Southern Maryland, uh, they're at Pax River, um, Naval Air Warfare Center Aircraft Division. And then we chose to bring in NETSI as our first fleet concentration. The reason why that seemed like a natural first um, non-Tech Bridge me member within the um, alliance is that 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 is the cradle of aviation. That is where we train all of our pilots. So that gives us a wide variety of experience levels. We have the guys who are just coming in, learning how to be Navy, learning their aviation craft, as well as, you know, when we start talking with some of the instructors, these are the pros, these are the SMEs, who they can tell you where all the bodies are buried and everything that's going wrong and what really needs to be fixed. So that was the reason why um, we chose to partner with NETSI initially. Now, we do see opportunity for growth within this. Um, this is kind of just our, our starting point. Um, but again, so if you are in the aviation community, talk to us. We would love to see if you could partner with us in this alliance. So I've talked a lot about engaging the deck plate sailors. We want to get that, that perspective, and we really feel like that is why this is so important, and especially within our uh, aviation community. So we really want to start solving problems side by side rather than 
throwing things back and forth to the fence because right now it's not that we never talk to the warfighter. Some of us, you know, may phone a friend, hey, I'm working on this thing. What do you think about this? Or someone may be even assigned to a certain project. But a lot of times there is a lot of red tape that that happens with. There's no direct access. That as of today, without the alliance, there's no way that um, an aviation member may have this great idea or something that's really eating his lunch. He can't come to us directly, has no idea what to do. We would love to help them um, solve these problems. So that's where uh, one of the things that we're really excited about this whole um, creating that working level relationship. So the next thing is we are developing problem solvers. We are um, empowering naval members to fix their own problems. Uh, of course, we want them to work with us, but it's it's more than that. It's creating that culture of innovation. It's empowering them. Again, this is uh, Pensacola. This is a cradle of naval aviation. A lot of these folks are just starting out in their career. We would love to see um, them feel like this is just what the Navy is. We can be innovative. We can have a voice to make a real change. Uh, next thing is, um, yep, fostering the culture. And then it's maturing the aviation ecosystem. So had mentioned previously, uh, this is just the start of this. And we really see an opportunity for growth. Uh, we were very specific in keeping this wide open to this is the aviation community. Um, we foresee in the future being able to partner with aviation organizations within other DOD entities, because um, again, some of us have the same problems. How can we work together? How can we leverage, you know, what you figured out and what you figured out? Um, Rick, do you have anything to add to that? Um, so as this model was maturing, we wanted to, as uh, Cassie mentioned, take advantage of of other ecosystems members. So we have the Army, also flies H-60s, similar problems. And it also gives us the ability to think outside the box, tackle places like Wichita, Kansas, Oshkosh, other areas where aviation on the commercial side is really blossoming with new airfoils, new designs. Um, and we think this model will allow us to go and try to infiltrate those ecosystems and push beyond um, a lot of the members and and relationships we currently have. Thanks, Rick. So that ends the formal portion of our presentation. We were really hoping that this could be a conversation. So no question is off the table. If you have ideas, if you're interested to keep out connecting, we would love to love to hear about it. Um, like we said, this is just starting out. Maybe there's something that we're we're missing that you think should be part of this. Yeah, go for it. So it it will be the same as the regular tech bridge structure. So you can large and small, whoever, if you have a great idea, you can engage um, with that. So to be a member of the alliance, just like the tech bridge, you have to uh, actually be part of the Navy. You need to be a federal agency. Um, but yes, we would love to partner with anybody out there with great ideas. So again, uh, the tech bridge is really a platform for in our case, the Navy, but we're hoping to expand that out to the Army and Air Force to engage with small business and, and traditional um, industry partners. So um, we don't necessarily have between us uh, the problem sets, you know, in my office and the, the labs and the resources. Really what we're enabling is our program offices, the folks that are trying to solve warfighter problems to connect with companies like yours. So in the sense that you're joining the ecosystem or participating on the platform, absolutely. Um, it's an open platform, an open ecosystem. Um, to the extent that we're sourcing problems and having members that are uh, directing what our technology areas that we're looking at or strategic thrust, that is again, the more on the government side. Yeah, so, and we've already, started partnering Central Florida and the Southern Maryland Tech Bridge on some of our 
events, uh, tech scans, that sort of thing, because we do ultimately um, buy a lot of the same stuff. So we have already kind of started this organization. So, and that's one of the values to you as an industry member of this alliance is now you have access to the larger aviation community. You can talk to several of us at once that you may be able to help out and partner with rather than going to each of us individually. We, um, we had a, a question there. Can we repeat the question that the gentleman asked? You want to, are you good at paraphrasing? Do you want to repeat it one more time? Is it, uh, oh, look at that. You Thank go. you. Yeah. I asked if, um, if, if, if the uh, Alliance was open to uh, large businesses also. The question was, are we engaged with the Advanced Engineering Technology Consortium in Pensacola? No, in, in Southern Maryland. In Southern Maryland. Um, uh, I'm not sure I'm familiar with that. The, the Naval Aviation Systems Consortium? Uh, they focus uh, on uh, multi-ant type uh, systems down there. Um, no, we can talk afterwards. I'd, okay. I'd love to hear Thank more you. information. Sure. So uh, NETSI has a pretty broad mandate. Are you guys just limiting yourselves to the component of NETSI that handles aviation training? Yes, because it is the Aviation Alliance. Yeah, but I think our goal, though, is to get within the, the A schools. So, like, park task trainers, anything that involves maintenance and um, readiness associated with naval aviation, I think it's also within our purview. So it's not just the traditional flight school type efforts, but also into the schoolhouses. Um, okay. And is there, can you talk about your relationship then to Sinatra? In that sense, or do you, do you want to take that one, or um, we can phone a friend? Um, we're still working out the ecosystem um, down in Pensacola with the training command. So um, that was a, uh, a quick and easy first step, um, but we're looking to build out the alliance. Um, we're also looking potentially at the University of. West Florida to be our local PIA partner, and then they would work with us to, to forge the other relationships with the other commands. Thank you. I think it is subordinate to me. Yeah. Um, and then the other one, we just had discussions here was NetSafa and trying to find, uh, they're, they're looking at places to do aviation training for our Alliance members and having that also be part of um, this Tech Bridge Alliance, not to be confused with our Alliance warfighting partners. Sure. Um, I think I think right now we're uh, wow. This mic, Steve, is like a lot more sensitive. Um, we are focused domestically, um, although again we had discussions with our uh, Navair FMS folks, and on the FMS side we were exploring those type of relationships. But in terms of um, business relationships, I think it's all U.S. domestic right now. As in most of the tech bridge, the Southern Maryland tech bridge. Again, I'm having that focus. There are other programs through ONR Global 
yeah, that engage with um, with our international partners. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, to that extent, the London Tech Bridge has been helpful uh, to open up some of those companies uh, in the UK, especially around unmanned. Um, but yeah. Yeah, no, that was a great question. Um, and like we had mentioned previously, this thing is new. I'm not saying that that can't happen ever, but that we're starting locally first. Any other questions? Cool, I think we're good. It, Ling, are there any online? Nope, okay. All right. Well, is, thank you. Everyone. Is that it? What, what, wait a minute. You guys, you guys are done. We're, we're efficient. Do you learn everything about the alliance? I think so. You guys are far enough apart from each other on the stage. Well, six right? feet. Over six feet. All right. Good. Well, we've got some time here to go live. So, one, did you talk about your tech bridge? You want to do that? You want to talk about your tech bridge? You've got. 10 minutes of live time with a captivated audience. So why don't you talk a little bit about Orlando because he gets a lot of play because he does all the peers. He's the best guy in the world. But why don't you go ahead and talk about the Orlando Tech Bridge because uh, you're the echelon four and you, you know, you always get stepped down by big brother. S3. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not, I'll give you a teaser. So actually, if you come back tomorrow morning at 9.15, Diana Teal, the Central Florida Tech Bridge Director, she will be giving a speech telling you everything there is to know about Central Florida and within our ecosystem. So um, what we do is we do modeling simulation training and human performance. And it's a very um, unique ecosystem in that uh, Four of the five services are co-located there. Space Force is coming. So we have, for many years, done things in a very collaborative way. And I think that's maybe why this Aviation Alliance felt like a really natural fit for us when, when Rick brought up the idea. Because um, we've seen a lot of success in the past when you start aligning yourself with partners who are in the same business space with you, have the same goals as you, rather than maybe, well, we say we're the same color uniform, so we should be co-located. Um, so when we do a lot of work for, for Rick and knock AD, so he's uh, our parent command. Um, so Rick, do you wanna talk about how that all ties in? Sure, absolutely. So uh, the Southern Maryland Tech Bridge is really the umbrella name of our industry outreach and engagement. So we have multiple partnership intermediaries that fall under the tech bridge. Um, the Patuxent Partnership is one of our premier partners that helps us engage industry. We have industry days, outreach days, one-on-one -on -one engagements with our technical folks, as well as a series of panels throughout the year where they bring in warfighters to talk with industry about warfighting problems. So um, for more information, you can check out their website, the Patuxent Partnership Dot org. Um, and then yesterday we heard from another one of our partnership intermediaries, Impacts, and Impacts um, assist NOC AD and NAVAIR with finding novel technologies and companies that can solve warfighter problems. They assist us with prize challenges, tech scans, um, and really a front door engagement uh, element as well. You can check out their website at impacts.tech. Um, they have a join our ecosystem. And I'd recommend joining that ecosystem. So in general, um, what our tech bridge focus on is anything aviation related. So uh, everything from manned, unmanned, rotary, fixed wing, um, and all of the subsystems that you would expect. Um, we've got a fairly vibrant OTA consortium as well that supports our efforts. Uh, the NAS, Naval Aviation Systems Consortium, at, uh, I think the website is nassolutions.org. Um, and those three organizations together make up our Southern Maryland Tech Bridge and really our, our outreach to industry in non-traditional ways. Well, so Rick, you, you have a lot of stuff going on there. It sounds like you're, you and Cassie have put together a great venue for folks to connect with you. But some of the things that you've talked with me about, about how the tech bridges are important when we talk about industry and warfighter problems, 
one of the things you bring up to me often is that this is the first time the T2s, the tech transfer teams, have been really, really cohesive and collaborative together. Is that, am I getting that right or am I way off on, on that description? Sure. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Um, I think the the model for tech trend now we're just riffing for the next. We're five riffing, but I think it's important because like you didn't talk to Alan Yeager a lot, did you before? Did you? I, I think the the um, focus on tech transfer has been shifting. So if we were to go back ten years, uh, I think the Navy and really the Department of Defense focus tech transfer on spin out of technology out of federal labs. So as a federal lab, I've got scientists, engineers that are trying to solve warfighter problems. Uh, in the course of that uh, work, they patent things. You know, we patent uh, innovations on their behalf. And so there is still a focus from our office on commercializing those innovations, trying to find uh, industry partners that'll take those technologies to market. I'd say within the last five years though, this uh, there has been a resurgence of the spin-in component so tech transfer was always contemplated to be both a spin out so taking DoD technologies out to the marketplace and then also taking commercial technologies into the DoD so these are not uh, technologies that the DoD is paying for don't think next-gen strike fighter but think technologies that are already in the commercial market that could be used to solve warfighter problems so that that second part of the spin-in has really been an increasing focus and really why um, things like this Naval Aviation Alliance have, have come around. We are scouring to find technologies to, to bring into DOD. Oh, uh, Nino's got, wait, Nino's got, he's got tons of questions. All right, you got a few minutes. What are the tech requirements for, oh, what are the requirements to, to become a tech bridge? Exactly, can you just line those out for me? Well, do you want to take that? I think um, that's a that's a longer question than three minutes. Yeah, and it, sure. So it's a great question. So we're we're um, tech bridges that have been designated by Naval X. So Naval X really holds that criteria of um, what what it takes to become a tech bridge. One of the key components though that Cassie mentioned was the federal lab component. So really these non-FAR based agreements that we're doing to engage with um, industry, cooperative research and development agreements, partnership intermediary agreements are reserved for federal labs. So a, a big component is a, is a uh, connection to a federal lab. It'd be a great question for a Naval X person. Uh, so Whitney, Whitney Talrika. Okay. We're, hey, we're, gonna, we're, we're getting off the, the stage here. So that was a long question, Nina. What are you doing to us there? No, no, I'm, he's got two minutes, but I got to get transferred over and do Ashley. I got to be the MC. I'm the MC. You're the participant. This is what happens. This is why Rick and I get along so well. So Rick, Cassie, thank you very much. We're going to go over to the next stage, to the, uh, the uh, summit stage, and I think we're going to talk to Ashley. I hold my Welcome to the summit stage. So 
back here on the summit stage and i have the pleasure of introducing one of my uh former workmates as a, as an alumni to naval x it's ashley and ashley is going to talk with you about diversity in the workplace so i'm going to let ashley get on with it because she she can talk and she's much more entertaining than i am and she has a great experience in this and i think we went through some stuff with, with through covid just just over the last year within the Department of Navy, we've had uh, diversity inclusion memos and, and how to make this uh, a better place, a better workplace for both uh, sailors, Marines, and then the Don workforce. So without further ado, Ashley, thank you. Steve's like my other favorite co-MC person. And so I uh, uh, appreciate you guys just giving me this platform to talk about this topic. And um, just uh, just for the people in the room, like looking around the room, this is always something that I see very often, like low attendance, you know, like, oh, you know, is it is it important? Does it matter? Well, hopefully uh, you guys can like share with your coworkers and your employees, like why these things matter. So talking about diversity, equity and inclusion in the workplace. Next slide. Um, I want to tell you guys like a, a short story. So last year, I was able to do a TED Talk with DAU that talked about this very topic. It was right after the events of George Floyd happened, shocked the nation, right? And so when I was asked to do this TED Talk, a crazy thing, like I said, man, should I use this platform to talk about being like black in the government and like my life and stuff? And I was a little scared and nervous. Then I said, well, you know what? I'm not going to do that because like that's probably so cliche. You no, know, then I thought I'm going to absolutely do it because I had the opportunity to, right? So during that, I shared about um, why diversity and inclusion was important, but my experience in the Pentagon. So I was here um, at Naval X, and I went, on, I went to the Pentagon for the first time. If anybody has seen it, it looks like a museum in there, and I love museums. And so walking down the hallways, like my eyes were like lit up like a candy store, like my eyes like really, really big. And then I walked down some halls that had leadership on the walls, and it kind of looked like this picture down here, right? Predominantly um, Caucasian white males, and then I think there was like a sprinkle of, you know, one or two others in like different branches. But I walked down the halls of the Commandant of the Marine Corps in the uh, CNO's office, and I was with my coworker. We're having some uh, conversations about uh, why I recruit at historically black colleges and universities, going to Black Engineer of the Year Award, uh, Hispanic uh, Society for Asian uh, Scientists and Engineers, the Deaf University, like why those things were so important. And my coworker, there was an employee at Naval X, he's, he's uh, rotated out, said, you know, why is something like Black Engineer of the Year Award uh, conference like really important, like was generally interested, uh, one of my Caucasian co male coworkers. And I said, well, hey, when I walked down the halls, when we walked down the halls of the CNO and the Commandant, did you see anybody that looked like me? He said, no. Then I said, you know, well, hey, did you ever recognize that you never saw anybody look like me? He said, I never thought about it. The biggest thing was like, People who are not represented on those walls think about it and see this every time they walk into the room, every time they walk down the hallways. And this is something that's like expected. Right. So if we go uh, to the next slide. So I kind of shared my experience and, and stories. And um, on the next slide, I go into it like a little bit deeper. Uh, so like in my mind, like I see this this workforce, I see these boardrooms and leaderships that have like diff people of different races, uh, different sexualities, uh, different ages. Like I see this in my head, like this room right here. Right. And so you think about it, like what? Why is it so important? Because representation does does matter. And we know that the country after the George Floyd incident happened, shocked the world. And everybody said, yeah, we got to do something. We realize and recognize that things are so different. So we want to, like, make these changes. We want to make the, the workforce and our boardrooms look like that. Next slide. And and making and I'm going to get to why, like, that's so important. So in my in my TED talk, I talked about this and I'm going to talk to you again. So these are just like you can Google this stuff all day. I don't have enough time to talk on all the different topics. And like you literally could take like a week long of trainings and meetings and things like a whole conference centered around different topics of diversity and inclusion, no matter where your, your companies are, where your organizations are in the DOD. And like you could talk to it about a week, all day, every day, and you still wouldn't have enough, right? But looking at some of these statistics, I talked about keeping the competitive advantage against our foreign adversaries. America has one thing that no other country literally can have, which is we have a diversity pool that is like nowhere else in the world. 
people from every different country, every different race, all different ages. In the workforce, we have the largest gaps between our workforce, like living here in the United States of America. So when we talk about a lot of the technologies, we also can tap into the people, right? Literally a resource that no other country can match the United States in. And so like, you know, looking at this, like gender, like these are like just, you know, you can just Google them. I, I did it so you can do it too, right? You know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, that's that balance of being, of having belonging, right? And so then you have like gender diverse companies are 15% more likely to outperform across the board than ones that are not. And then if you put like ethnically diverse, like, um, like groups in there, it's even higher, even higher, like performing. They, they looked at finances. They looked at, you know, work-life balance. They looked at everything. And literally the more diversity you have in many different things, you just have, you just have better performance. So if you go to the next slide, um, uh, if everybody knows who this gentleman is, raise your hand. Raise your hand in the room. All right, so uh, this is the Honorable uh, Sec Secretary, the Honorable James Hondo Gertz. He's retired. He was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy's Research, Development, and Acquisition. Actually helped stand up Naval X and, like, coin it to what we know it to be today. And then he actually got, um, after the um, the administration changed, he got a new position as the Undersecretary. And so he come, he came to Naval X a lot, like all the time. He's like, you know, friend of Naval X. And so then um, as he was leaving his position and getting ready re to retire, he brought in the new undersecretary who was like going to be acting and taking the position. Now, can anybody raise their hand and tell me who that person is? No, not Julie and Todd. No, not, not Naval X people. Y'all are cheating. Y'all were here. But can anybody tell me? No name? No? Next slide, please. I'm a big engagement person. Uh, her name is um, it's the Honorable uh, Meredith Berger. She is the Assistant Secretary of the Navy's for Energy, Installation, and Environment. Now, crazy story, I'm going to give you full transparency into my life. You would think, yes, woman, she knows diversity and inclusion. Black, she knows diversity and inclusion. Yeah, she should know and expect these. Remember that picture I showed you? Expecting the boardrooms in the workplace to look like this. But I'll be honest, I struggle. I don't. I have it in my mind, but making that a reality is different. Short story. Uh, Secretary Gertz at the time brought in the new undersecretary, was getting a presentation at Naval X. And so we're sitting here. This was maybe a, two weeks after she was appointed as acting. So I didn't have had no idea. She, uh, she walks into the room and sits down. And I am literally sitting here waiting for some more people to walk through the door. So then Secretary Gertz said, hey, let's get started. I'm looking. I'm like, well, where's the undersecretary? It was her. It was her. I had no idea, and I was expecting a man to come through the door, even as a woman who does things in diversity and inclusion, still expecting what we normally see, right? And so I, my mind was blown away. I'm asking, like, did you guys know this? I'm like asking some people. Some of us knew. Some of us didn't. But then afterwards, I said, I walked up to her, and I said, you know what? I'll be honest. I did this tech talk last year. I... um. I'm like, I'm in this field of diversity and inclusion, and I still did not expect you to walk through the door. I said, hey, thank you for stepping up to the plate, for saying yes, because you didn't have to. Represent representation matters. And I appreciated her for even like taking the leap because that's a huge position to carry like the weight of. And so like even someone like me who is like heavy in this field, I said, oh, my gosh, she started. And two weeks later, didn't even know who this was because I just wasn't aware and I wasn't expecting it. How many of us still expect the same things, but we know we're having these, con these con uh, conversations about something different? Next slide, please. Uh, so this is, I'm gonna talk about this gentleman because he's actually my second level supervisor. One, because I'm leaving Naval X in two weeks, so I gotta do a plug. But second of all, it's because he did something really great after the George Floyd incidents, and then the world said, oh my gosh, we are messed up. The pandemic happened. George Floyd happened. There was a lot of things against um, the Asian community. We, there was things happening all over the country that literally made so much like just mess in our minds and our hearts, our spirits, our souls, literally across the nation. And so um, this is my um, uh, super supervisor, Mr. Johnny Delos. This is an old picture. I thought it was cool because he got to meet President Obama back in 2014. But what he did was every week and still going to this day, every week, on a Monday or Tuesday night in his free time, he allowed um, any employee in his division to come and talk about their feelings in a complete safe space. There were different races, different religions, different sexualities, different sexes, all on this call, sometimes 20 to 30 to 40 people. Okay, maybe not 40. I, I think it was like, it was, it was 
it was going up and down about like how many the tenants were, but like people were hurting and we didn't, we were talking about it maybe in our small communities, but never collectively as a group. And so people say, hey, why does this matter? It felt really good to hear from people who had former police backgrounds, didn't have that, former military backgrounds, most of us are civilians, uh, different religions, different races, all these things that I probably never would have, uh, me as a person of color may not have talked about it outside of my circle if this gentleman, uh, Johnny Deloche, did not have that space to make it safe to talk about it at work. We did it off Zoom, of course, it was COVID, but we, we talked about it. And so now today, literally today at the same time, he's actually getting an award for the Distinguished Eight just for having this call, literally asking a coworker, can I use your Zoom? And then having these conversations week and week and week where we were able to talk about all these things, okay? Um, next slide. Um, so wanted to talk to you guys. So the main thing is, hey, we can have all these conversations all day. Well, what are you guys doing about uh, doing about it? One of the easiest things in the DC area, we have a large diversity pool. So now I'm also speaking to people that don't even have this pool. Um, uh, Carterock, Carterock uh, has 10 leadership focus areas that they're working on. Uh, strategic planning, business, facilities, um, uh, uh, innovation, like and some other things, and one of the 10 being diversity, equity, inclusion. Meaning that leadership focus area means they have the top cover of the CEO. Uh, uh, our CEO is uh, Captain Hutchison. Like saying, hey, this is important to me. He came on these calls, shared his life story, and say, hey, this is why it matters to me. I'm gonna make this a priority. Right. Even if we have this in this area, making it a priority was was very important. Um, and one of the things that uh, that Han that secret the honorable um, that's Hondo. I'm just going to say Hondo. So used to that. Right. Sue me later. Um, but Hondo always talked about four different categories. Um, the diversity of like who, you know. About what, you know, so he actually talked about in a room of army people, like a room of Navy people bringing in someone from the army. Right. Um, where you're from and then your different life experiences, something along those lines, talking about how that impacts so much. And so um, and so one of the things that Carter Rock did was say, hey, guess what was the, the, the diversity inclusion team uh, at first? It was two black guys and it was one Hispanic woman. Kind of fits like the opposite of what we were talking about. But but no, don't worry. They recognize it. We say, hey, we need to get some more voices in here. This is a huge topic where you could literally go down into the weeds in different places um, and try to like, you know, fix your commands. Everybody has different things. Everybody fix your companies, right? Everybody has different needs. So how do you tackle that? Well, first, you can't have just one person of one race or one sexuality or one person like in the job. It's not going to work. Even if you have a couple, it's not going to work. This is literally something that we said, hey, to tackle this widespread problem, we need people who are passionate and wanted to talk about these different topics like that fall under diversity, equity, and inclusion, because there's many different avenues that you could talk to. So uh, a call went out, and then the team turned from three to about 10 to 12. And then from that, we broke them into sub teams like we met and they all, also on our own time. So things say, oh, if I'm not getting paid for it, I'm not going to do it. It's got to be a passion, but then how do you create that passion if you don't see that there's a problem, right? So we saw the problem. We say, hey, you know, this team is too small and we're not diverse enough to have even tackle this topic. How are we getting the voices of everybody in the room? So made four different teams. And I want to speak to these teams because this is literally something that Carter Rock has done and made four different teams from the DEI team. And this is like leadership focus areas are like short term. A uh, little bit of funding we've asked for for next year just to do as much as we can. So team one talked about increasing hiring under uh, for underrepresented demographics. As we know, a lot of things people think it's like black and white. But no, we're talking about women, Hispanics, Asian, like different. What I talk about in the beginning, like the diversity of having everything here in America, which is something that we don't have. So increasing hiring. So one team is looking at specific things and like it's not I didn't I didn't know if it was publicly releasable. So I didn't want to get in trouble. I got to go back home in two weeks. Remember? Um, so I, I said, hey, this is something that one team is dedicated to doing. Um, the second team, improving retention and increasing minority applicants for leadership positions. Talking about, yes, at the workforce level, you're starting to see it more. But guess what? If we don't feed that pipeline, how are we going to pull in the GS? 13s, 14s, 15s, SESs, admirals, generals, and, and all the other different things if there's not even a pool coming up behind them. Because you can say, yes, I'm going to go hire someone else at those levels. Guess what? The pool isn't there. 
So again, it's going to take some time, but we recognize this to say, hey, let's start seeing what we can do to keep people there. How we make sure they're not going to other organizations uh, uh, for government, going out of industry, and then vice versa, right? So second team is doing that. The third team is increasing knowledge and awareness of DEI. Um, being in rooms of all men, you might hear slurs that are talking about women, right? But may not even recognize that because it's never been pointed out. Just like my coworker didn't realize there was nobody that looked like me on those walls. Just like that simple awareness and bring awareness, we actually started up a team that is bringing that to, to the forefront of your minds. Because the thing about subconscious biases, we all have them. You can Google them many things about it. But the thing is, you need to be in the room with somebody else that brings it to the forefront. And that's why I have friends that I get like of, of every single, everything you can talk about because I'm constantly challenging myself so that I don't get embarrassed when a new undersecretary comes in and it's somebody that I wouldn't have expected, right? I mean, I didn't feel embarrassed, kind of, sort of, not really, but I talked to her, right? So, yeah, increasing the knowledge and awareness, doing this by having facilitated conversations, starting those uh, different talks that we talked about, like my, my supervisor had done, making a safe place to talk. Because the thing is, most of us want to talk about this, but if you don't look like me, I'm not going to say it. But then how much can I really learn if you look like me? If you're, where, if you're from where I'm from, how much can I really learn? So bring awareness, like looking at free trainings, like LinkedIn LinkedIn has a lot of them free for the government, and then or low-cost things around that we can share. And one thing, too, sharing I'm sharing this on this platform because other warfare centers might be struggling or at different places. Other companies or, or PIA partners, contracts, they might be struggling. So like, hey, let's talk about it. Let's not redo all the rework. Let's work together because clearly we've seen this as a problem we're all facing, right? So why not like leverage off of other people's opportunities? And one thing that's good, I started seeing for like, um, I'm, I'm helping out with this event, the Hispanic Heritage um, event. And then previously last month, the Women's um, History Month, all the warfare centers came together and leveraged. Hey, we're not going to have this speaker and this speaker and you pay and you do this and you do this. Hey, bringing it all together. And the Women's, the Women's Heritage Month was a phenomenal program because 10 warfare centers came together. Um, the, the, the one that's coming up, you might have leads from one, but it's all 10 warfare centers coming together, right? So like doing stuff like this and the last one, um, developing an inclu inclusive competencies and skills. Like one thing we know about training is that when it's mandatory, how do you guys feel about mandatory trainings? Oh, I got to check a box. I have to do my due diligence. I have to be able to get a good, good, you know, um, demo at the end of the year for those in the act demo system. I have to get a good demo. So if I don't take my training, I'm not going to I'm not going to get my points. Right. Well, the thing is, like, we have to create this passion in, in ourselves, but like knowing and recognizing in the room. Hey, that was a little racist. You said that. Hey, that was a little sexist. You said that, like saying those things in the rooms with people around you brings that awareness that people sometimes don't even recognize that we have. And like I said, everyone is affected by this, no matter what your race is, no matter what your struggle is, um, or the privileges. You know, we talk about those things. Everybody deals with this. And so it is important to help others recognize, especially your friends, like, hey, you know what? That's not okay. Look, look, that is not okay. You shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have did that. Like, how do you, how would that feel if this was your XYZ son, brother, sister, mother, father, husband, wife, right? Those different things actually make a difference. And so Carter Rock is literally doing these things. Like there's there's lots of work that we've done. Um, well, we, I've been busy with Naval X, but Carter Rock, I, I called in like every, as much as I could, but meeting two times a week to make sure, hey, we are ready for the next fiscal year. So like, hey, this, this has only been a year. And then we go to the next slide. And um, this has only been a year. And so like we want to be able to do these things so that we can like like go into the next level of what of what's to come to like being able to be in the mi mi mindsets and what's to come. And so one thing I want to want to show is um, is the, the, the charge for everybody here. So I come and there's a charge to literally each and every one of us. And it's not just like I'll do it when I can. Like, no, a daily thing to keep in your uh, forefront is that everyone plays a role in this. It's not just a leadership responsibility and responsibility. It's not for leadership and it's not just the bottom. It's top, bottom and everywhere in between to make this thing happen, to make this realistic, to make to make something look like this literally reality and then being in the right mindset to accept when it happens so it doesn't feel weird. I made a joke one time. Um, I, if I walked into a Fortune 100 company and the boardroom was all black women, I would think I'm in the wrong place. I'll be honest. That's kind of weird. I'm like, is this right? 
if I walk, I mean, maybe other countries where, you know, most of the, the, it's not a lot of diversity in the country. If I walked into a boardroom of all women or all this or all that, I would feel kind of weird because like, I'm not expecting that. I'm not, I'm not ready for that. I want it to happen, but I'm not ready for it to happen. But I know it's my responsibility to keep on like doing my due diligence and part about that. And continuing to challenge your own biases. Like I said, we all have them and it's okay. It's not a bad thing. The bad thing is not recognizing it and then not like, you know, you see the, um, you see it, say it, hear it when they leave a bag in the airport, right? Doing that when it comes to this topic. Um, giving yourself and your team grace. Guys, we're going to make mistakes. I make them. You make them. We all make them. I've made mistakes. And I'm saying, I, I've literally even thinking when I've done wrong things or said wrong things. And I'll go and ask somebody if I feel like I've offended them. Hey, is what I said okay? Like constantly trying to ch like put my checks and balances in place and bring the awareness to it. But you got to give grace and know that, hey, we're making mistakes and trying to learn because if you don't do this, this is a key part. If you don't do this, people will clam up and you won't hear about this again. These conversations will not continue. And then also realize that this takes time and to be patient. Just talking about the, the struggle of African-Americans, slavery was for 400 years. We don't like to say that word, I'm gonna say it. It was for 400 years. You're not gonna undo it in a year. And any, in any other um, society, like there's many different organ, different, many different people that have gone through many things in the struggle, but understanding with grace and patience that we can come to a different spot. And we have to realize that it does take time. People say, oh, I wish I want this to happen now. Like some people are so passionate, so angry. Slow your roll. It's going to take some time because this did not get like this overnight. It's not going to be able to be fixed overnight. And so, like, you know, just wanted to give you guys some tidbits and things, and we can go to the next slide. Um, if you guys want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, like, I didn't I didn't put Naval X or Carterock on here because I didn't go through the publicly releasable. I do things at the last minute. Sorry, guys. But um, if you guys have questions, you can reach out to me and, and um, pending my PAO at Carterock's approval. I'd love to share with other, like, warfare centers or military syscoms, like, what we're doing, um, and then, like, see what we can do after that because, like, hey, guys, we don't want all the rework to have to happen. But people have to start making those changes, but it takes everybody in this room and then on the virtual audience. And then then you can impact things much more exponentially if you say, hey, yep, I got a part to play. That's it. <laughs> so I'm not an expert. So if you have questions, I have no problem saying I don't know. I don't know everything. But if you guys have questions, you know, let me know. Um, hi, my name is Travis Heinen with BMNT, a consultant group. Um, one of the things that strikes us when we look within the government sphere is when you get inside a building, all of those people belonging to different organizations, you know, the coming from different avenues into so you know into the building. So I think about ONR, you have civilians, you have military, you have federal, you have contractors, you have um, detailees, you've got rotational fellows. How do you start to approach the fact that you can't always control some, you know, some of those bullets that they're hiring? Well, we don't necessarily hire all those individuals. They come through different avenues. Retention. Well, some of those are on different pathways for retention and why they're in the building together to form that community. How do we start to think about addressing things like that where we don't necessarily always hold the reins over those decisions? Um, that's actually a really great question. So I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to tackle it. So um, when you have like such like a diverse pool and not having control over it, essentially you do have control over it be in, in some cases, in some cases, if you think about a recruiter's office, I'm thinking military, there's a position that is a billet of a recruiter, right? That position, that position may be one person or another. You don't have a choice because they're doing that at that level. But the thing is telling them about stuff like this, Hey, What's happening? Because if you're starting to see year after year, like most of the stuff, we have town halls that are internal and the demographics and everything, like how many people we hire, what they were, where they're from, where their schools are, that stuff is mostly transparent. But here's the thing, if it's not transparent, ask why. Ask the leadership why, like, hey, why don't, why don't we know what's going on? Why don't we have this avenue or these connections? Like, just asking that question makes you that gives you that re, um, responsibility, gives you gives you like a, a part into that. Say, hey, why are we not doing this? So if you're a civilian, you can't go ask the, the military recruiting office, hey, why did why are your stats not looking different in the, in the next five years? Right. Um, so that, that's one way. But I'm um, also like having those conversations to ask why, because your leadership, uh, some places have those suggestion boxes. I know 
Um, a lot of places they've have it where like CEOs are commanding. Well, I just know um, our, our base, we do dropping just a little something. Hey, what, why is this not changing? What is not changing? And then like sharing these things, like having these conversations. Cause like, it's not a, just a simple, like my, the team that we had at car this last year, um, like we don't have it all figured out. We're still like learning and saying like, Hey, what does hiring actually look like? Well, guess what? If we don't have 10 recruiters going to 10 schools we've never been because we only got two, we can't even hit the 10 schools, right? Bringing that awareness. Leader, that's where the top cover comes in saying, hey, we need some more recruiters, guys. We need you. Like, hey, there's funding or, hey, there, there's avenues that we can do this or, hey, where would you like to go? Pushing that out to the leadership because it is their responsibility too because they they paved those ways for success. Um, so I hope that answers it a little bit. Um, a little bit uh, to just say, how do we how do we get involved when it's not really my control? Because you're right. Retention is the same way, like creating that environment because like it's saying, hey, you know what? You matter. What can we do to work with you to stay here? Right. All those things is just deeper conversations to have. I've got a slide up there that reference organizations that were gender diverse and uh, diverse in general perform better than was there any data that you or definitions that stated what gender diversity is like is there a threshold or was there some discrete definition of what that means yes yeah, so actually that's I, I didn't have a slide on there but i actually like had that in um what another presentation i did was um over 30 percent minimum if you think about it what is the country is like around that 30 to 40 to 50 percent. And I think there was a Time magazine put this out in the year 2050. What what America would look like. Right. Everybody, you know, everything's all mixed. Like, you know, I think I looked at those pictures. I could not guess who was what just like off break, just like from general just analysis. But it's about it's around 30, 30, 30, 30 to 35 percent is like the number that you want to hit. Most organizations two, five, ten, twelve. 10, 12 maybe 15. So like, it's, it's not even close, not even close for a workforce and leadership It's even lower in leadership. So yeah, but there, the numbers are, is around 30 to 35%. And that's where you start to be that more effective, um, uh, percentages. Okay. Well, yep. Um, if you guys don't have any more questions, I'm here for the rest of the week. Find me, stop me, ask them. I'm good to go. Thank you. Ashley, thank you. Always as interesting as, as usual. Um, so we're going to, uh, I think you, yeah, you got a couple minutes left. Did nothing else you want to talk about or? Uh, I could talk for five more hours. So I know uh, you're passionate about yeah. this topic. <laughs> We've been together a long time to, uh, uh, working with this stuff and, and I know you're passionate about it and, and it, and it shows every day on, on what you do for, uh, diversity and inclusion and just in the study that you put into it. And did you tell them about your Ted talk? Yeah, I, I know you did. I heard about that. I just want to say it again. So yeah, she did the TEDx. Is that right? Yeah, yeah fancy with with the DAU. So that's that's wonderful. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna move over to the uh, global stage for the last presentation of the day, um, and then I'll, I'll I'll also be emceeing that, and I'll uh, uh, make some uh, closing remarks over there for the day. Uh, and there's a, a a nice thing about air conditioning and what we're gonna do on this stage at the end of the day. So. Uh, uh, be sure to stick around for that. Ashley, again, thank you very much.
Craig, you're going to anchor the day. Day two of the third annual Agility Summit with an exciting brief. And I say exciting. Here's why I say exciting. It's, he's going to unmanned campaign plan. So Craig's going to talk with us about everything unmanned in, in the campaign plan. And I know this is a big, uh, big part of what we're doing within the Department of, of the Navy uh, today. And there's a lot of effort behind this. And, and I think there's going to be a lot of questions. Um, so Mike Runner, you ready, Lineman, you, you ready for this? Cause, cause we're probably going to run the mics together. All right. Without further ado, Craig, take it away and dazzle them. So with a, whoa, let me do a quick sound check there. Um, with a speech like that, my plan is to do a three minute brief, take no questions and end the day. Right. You could, you could do that, but, but I don't think you should because what you've worked on for like I don't know, almost a year now has come to fruition and I really am excited about it. So stop it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I do appreciate that everybody, everybody that's here, I appreciate seeing a full crowd at the end of the day. I know there's a bunch of people that'll, that'll be tuning in online or, or even possibly watching this later. So um, I'll also try to keep this. I'm going to try and keep myself to under 20 minutes to, to talk about some of the slides so that I can give some time to actually have some good dialogue with everybody out here. Um, first thing I wanna do is thank the Naval X team. They're doing an outstanding job. If you guys are sitting in the room or you guys are, are not inside the room, watching them feedback between two stages, indoors, outdoors, all these different events, keeping both a vir virtual and a hybrid team actually connecting, this is absolutely amazing. Um, so real fast about myself, again, Craig Sawyer, I've been working for the Navy for actually DOD and government for over 20 years. So I have probably one of the least linear careers I think out there as far as working in the Navy. I started as an enlisted guy right out of high school, joined the army for money for college, ended up jumping out of planes, helicopters, everything I could do not to keep on the ground. So that ended up with Naval, or with the army's uh, special warfare community. I went with 10 special forces groups for a while as an enlisted guy got out and actually started to work for the Navy at the shipyards. So WG worker, blue collar worker, when I first got back out in the last 20 years, I have worked again, everything from the WG to the GS pay scales. I've been a uh, combat systems engineer on nuclear subs, Project Soup, out to San Diego to support eye level, joined NAMC's executive fellowship a few years back, started to play in the unmanned space pretty heavily then. So PMS 406, the Warfare Center's ONR, went to Indo-PACOM as a science advisor tour for a short stick, then kind of came back again to kind of wrap that whole understanding of everything that's going on in the space. How do you connect all these capabilities? How do you connect all this stuff? And it has been kind of fundamental to land in OpNav at the right time in the right place while there's kind of an interest in, in all of this space. So disclaimer that I'm gonna put out here, if there's something that I say that seems negative, I have nothing against any programs, people, the organization. I am optimistically frustrated with where we are in the Navy today. I think we can do better. So if you see anything up here that says, hey, we're not doing enough or we're not doing things right, it's not against any program. It's not against anybody. I think there's fantastic people. There's pockets. This is speaking to high level general places. Are we where we need to be? Okay. so. Kind of go back on a, on a centering concept for this. This is not the first time anybody has tried to say, hey, maybe we ought to do something about innovation. Maybe we ought to get a team together, try and do something different. Um, fundamentally, the way I look at this, though, is the Navy for unmanned systems has in several stages, several years, over actually a couple decades, gone back and forth between the first two models. So I think 2011, there was a DOD cross-functional team or or a team that was stood up to try and get after unmanned and autonomous systems. Um, again, what happens when you get a centralized team, a coordinated effort? It's really nice because you have you can take a bound problem, you can move really fast, you align resources, you can really deliver something quickly. But it's also fairly usually fairly narrow. It's not really exploratory. It doesn't expand. It doesn't doesn't move along with the pace. So after a couple of years where they made the progress for some of those and they're not seeing the same gains. Navy still went back to a more decentralized approach. You saw it go back again, I think in 2015, 2017 timeframe. Uh, 
DAS and Unmanned N99, if you guys are familiar with that. Again, bring the resources back together. Let's, let's start putting together our strategic plan. Let's start going down the field together. 2018, early 2018, late 2017, they disestablished that, moved the efforts again back out to the resource sponsors, out to different, or different groups. Again, not wrong. It allows multiple people to go in parallel paths, advance things to what makes sense for the communities. But what happens when you diffuse that group again is you start to see divergent ideas. You saw, you see a lack of integration, a lack of shared resources. You get diffused efforts going in the same direction. So of course, playing the whole Goldilocks, if the first one's too hot, the second one's too cold, perfect, right? The third, the third idea is gonna solve all problems. What's different though is now you're just adding a lot of people and a lot of resources to a team. And it might be the right answer, it might not be the, it might not be the right one for the time. So fundamentally, we'll kind of circle back onto this, this concept at the end. I think one of the big fundamentals that I have, I have a great mentor who I'm working with now, who would arguably say, so which one is it? Is it one, two, or three? And the answer is, it's all of them. At the right time and place, you probably want to apply the right pressures. At the time and place, you want to start going and open your aperture again to explore things. And at some time, you're actually going to have to bring the whole community back together and you're going to need some more coordination, which requires more people, additional duties, additional processes or, or efforts to try and bring everybody back to a convergent goal. So on some of these early slides, I'll go pretty quick. You should see this if you guys are familiar. The Unmanned Campaign Framework was published, I think, March 16th. Conveniently right ahead of, uh, I think, Hass testimony the day after. <laughs> so we were driving on this for a while again. Um, the Navy was, if you go back a year ago, the Navy's budget, I think, in 22, or was it would be the 22 budget, but so two years ago in 2019, a lot of the, the unmanned assets faced a lot of scrutiny on the Hill. Um, the, the CNO at the time was actually got to get some, some pretty direct questions, some very hard questions where it was, hey, we don't see all your systems going in the same place. I see some of your air domains going fast and is going on, on the remote controlled operations. I see some of your undersea domain is going, going on autonomous and AI based. What, what is the plan? How are you sharing resources? How are you getting to your goals? And then challenging the, the best question you know, from Congress is, how does that actually interact with Army, Air Force? You know, how is it that this, is, this should not be the Navy going alone and it shouldn't be the Navy going in three different directions? So as we are looking into this, we started again, what's the foundational principles? Where is the Navy trying to get to? Why is unmanned one of those spaces? We keep going after the idea and the concept of distributed maritime operations. Again, I won't spend the whole time going into this. I think we can all say that there are efforts being made towards this, but I think the, the big message right now from CNO, VCNO and others is, is the progress we're making sufficient and urgent enough? When we move forward, before going too far, I just wanna make sure that unmanned as a, as a task force, unmanned as a capability, I don't think I actually wanna conflate those two phrases. We do not see inside the task force, inside some of the groups, unmanned is not seen as a capability unto itself. Unmanned is an attribute, it's a virtue of the technology. It's something that we can leverage to have capability or greater capacity if we harness it in the right places. Unmanned can be a terrible adjective as well. When we can speak from unmanned could be anything from remote operations to a fully autonomous vessel it loses a lot of its context when we're starting to talk to Congress without being able to have an actual articulate conversation. What is actually unmanned about the vessel? What is actually autonomous? Is the weapon system making a decision of targets? No, it's probably a human right now. Things of those natures complicate that picture. It complicates our stakeholder involvement. I think one of the big takeaways that we'll say about this is our goal is to use the right level of autonomy at the right purpose for the right mission. And on the bottom is that tagline is always we're going to operate in a legal and responsible manner. Nothing about unmanned or autonomous systems is ever gonna remove the responsibility to be ethical and follow the laws of war. So, looking at this, this is more of just programs of records. This is kind of a placemat scene setters for people to see. 
Um, there's hundreds of other systems that are in development in either the S&T and the R&D realms. There's a lot more special stuff on the, the special warfare side. They use a lot more smaller and more attributable or dispensable assets. This was kind of a caging of what's the major programs of record and where are things at today. Again, things that you'll see, the air domain, fairly permissive environments going after remote control operations. You have those line of sights in the long ranges. The undersea domain, or most of their maturity comes back down here on the lower side on the smaller assets where the autonomy can actually meet those demands. It doesn't need to be super brilliant. It just needs to be able to mow a minefield. It needs to be able to do its patterns. It needs to be able to do its things. Some of them don't even have obstacle avoidance on them. They will just hit the mountain. They'll keep trying to plug along until they, until they break through and keep moving. Um, why? Because you're not hurting anything when something's that small. The other thing to keep in note, I mean, we have been operating the glider fleet for SIDMOC and oceanography for decades. There's, I think at any given time, there's a couple hundred assets around the globe being picked up by other fishing boats, dropped in new Gulf streams, new waters. The Navy has not been doing unmanned just for the last five years. It has been going on for decades. Fundamentally though, as we keep going into kind of the higher orders, I guess if we look here, some of the newer stuff that you see that, that's, that's really challenging the budgets and the stakeholders is when we start talking about war fighting assets. So those of like XLUUV, uh, LUSV, things that are actually supposed to be armed combatants or supporting the fleet with that is really where we see a lot of value, but we also see a lot of challenges. And are we, are we really there yet? One of the challenges to get there is how expensive, how are we actually gonna support this? Do we have the right models to understand? Is it sustainable? Is it advantageous? Do we need it to be a fully unmanned platform? Can we do things with optionally manned, minimally manned? Is there some sort of hybrid force of what's the right answer for the solution? If we continue down our old and traditional platform-centric approaches to capabilities, we continue to buy the autonomy, the platform, everything is a package deal. That is fundamentally not a great deal for the government. We don't wanna actually have to spend the next time we wanna compete something. If we already have a mine laying asset that can navigate fishing fleets, avoid obstacles, get to where it needs to go and operate a payload, I don't wanna actually compete that when that vessel is no longer valid or I wanna upgrade the vessel. So how do we start working to kind of break this apart again um, a lot of this is acquisition strategy. A lot of this is us being able to identify standards, interfaces, architectures that can work with industry. When we talk to the PSMs and a bunch of other people, they see the value in this. We understand we would love to get to these kinds of things. This gets us more to an agile environment where we can change out a, a pickup truck, a payload, whatever, on top of our existing infrastructure. PSMs, their biggest challenge back to us is, okay, great, can you actually do that? Do we have our skill sets? Do we have the ability within the DOD to be the, the integrator to, to operate at this speed? These are fundamental challenges. I don't think that we are, I think we're exploring right now. And no efforts again with the campaign plan. We have everything from N1, NPS, the Navy War College, talking about rates, ranks, education programs, engineering programs, do we have anything right to actually be able to move towards that, that, that environment where we can move um, to the more, I guess, capability-centric approach there is, is, is really what we're trying to find. What are the barriers to get to that? This slide's pretty redundant to that. Again, we don't want to have all of this all in one black box. We would like to be able to make, make package deals as we choose. This is kind of the a la carte. I don't wanna buy the whole cable package. I just wanna be able to buy the things that I wanna look for or I need to change. All right. So when we were doing this again, this comes right back from the, the original framework that we established a while back. Um, kind of four key tenets that we, we keep seeing around this is that first one up there speaks again, how do we, how do we make decisions? Right now, we kind of do that a lot in uh, calendar cycles when we're talking about budgets. We make down selects. If we wanna do INP and FNC portfolios, those are done on an annual basis. Is that really rapid enough or is that agile enough to take advantage of opportunities? 
And fundamentally, the answer is no. It's also tied to budget cycles as far as when you want to carry that over. Is, is the annual POM process the right way to be able to take advantage of things in the near term? So how can we actually work on problems like that as part of these things that we need to be able to decouple and understand as part of the campaign frame? So the campaign, or the, again, the platform focus we just got through is our operating model of how we procure things right. Answer is probably for larger ships, it actually does make sense. For emerging technology, fastly evolving technology, it's not rapid enough to be able to go through those iterations. What else do we see as problems that we are fundamentally running into on the regular? So, um, I think one of the bottom. I think the one of the bottoms is the key here is the zero tolerance culture of failure. I don't know if I would exactly call it zero tolerance culture of failure, um, but it's the ability. How do we evolve to a point where we get to the intelligent acceptance of risk? How much information is enough to take a calculated risk? when it comes to fast moving technologies. If we wait for perfect answers and perfect information, we're never gonna be able to move at the pace that we're supposed to. Spending too much time on the back matter. So what you're probably more interested in is, okay, great, got all that, it's really important, painted a horrible picture, we're doing a lot of things wrong. How do we do something different about this? So again, if on the right, we talked about really on the campaign framework, what we published, it's kind of that self-admission of what do we know isn't working for us today? What are the things we'd like to change? In the last few months since that has been issued, we've done a good hard look and spent a lot of time with the senior leaders. So everything from the force design to the CNO's nav plan to the tri-maritime service, all were coming out around the same time we were doing the framework. These really foot stomp that it's an imperative that we actually change. So this is where we're kind of seeing a different nexus from what the, the first slide was showing. We actually have that support from top down and bottom up to do something different. Right now, who's leading the charge right now with really the ASNRDA and the VCNO taking weekly inventory of where are you guys at? What would you guys think of this proposal? How would you do this? Being in some very uncomfortable rooms, we probably pitched hundreds of ideas on how we might actually do this. It would probably be, shouldn't be surprising that not many of those ideas were, were popular at first. Um, but again, it's the iteration, it's the discussion with them. What could we do? Is this something we should do? Is this something that's gonna upset other people? Or I should correct that one. The VCNO and ASNRDA are not worried about upsetting somebody. They are worried about doing, solving operational problems right now but they're making sure that, is this a, a good use of our time? Is this a good use of our resources? Do we have a foundation that's, that sound, that I wanna put resources and people onto? So that really comes to, uh, the CNO has announced, I think it was last week, that he's standing up the task force. So we've gotten to a good place with the VCNO and ASNRDA, where they've seen the ideas, there's some framework, there's some thought behind this, that they're ready to go after putting the people into creating an, a, a team to start working across this. I think this looks really familiar to a lot of the other things. Again, if we took a look at what we said in the campaign framework, we look at the strategy, we understand we can't do this alone from tri-maritime joints and allied partners. We fundamentally cannot fund the future that we want going alone. We have to make sure that it's connected, that we can do distributed maritime operations that these things will be relevant in the fight in the context that we expect to have. And of course, we need to solve, solve or mitigate real operational problems. Now, I imagine I could get a, a whole bunch of fire of, show me somebody in the Navy that doesn't think that's their, their, their main mission. So I think what the task force really has to do is if we're gonna take something and we're gonna move fast with this, I would almost, pardon me, I think while I was sitting around looking at this slide, I'd like to almost make that a target you can look in that outside realm. Hey, that's all of the operational gaps we have, all the needs that we have. Those are great. There's places, there's traditional acquisitions that can get those. So what's really important to the warfighter? Let's talk to the fleet. Let's actually get their inputs. Let's have them on the team to have this discussion. That's probably that next circle inside. Then you actually get another layer deep. What's actually feasible in a time frame that matters? So we're not gonna talk about something that delivers, I would love time travel, but if that's gonna be something in 2098, it's probably not relevant to really go after today. 
So again, what's feasible and fundable within a, within a time frame that matters? If you get all the way down into that centerpiece of what hits all of those categories and is within the unmanned scope, it's probably actually going to be a handful of things. What am I doing for time? I'm going to cut people short on questions. So I'll make sure these are up there, but the fundamentals again, why do we need a task force? We believe that our challenge, again, to communicate where that effect is, where we want to go with unmanned, both internal and external to the Navy is not being coherently communicated. That's on us, that's on our stakeholders. We're not sending a consistent message. The task force needs to be able to do that in order to achieve success. The other side, the capacity. We're not delivering capabilities soon enough to be relevant in the next fight. It is a fundamental belief that keeps continuing to, to sweep the building, and that sense of urgency is actually helping us get traction. So the question is, are there opportunities that can actually be fielded in the near term that actually will contribute to the fight? It doesn't have to be the perfect solution. It might be the thing that buys us time until the programs of record come in behind them. But where can we actually find those things? Our ability to learn. So the common barriers, those enablers. Do we need GPS? Do we need long endurance batteries? Do we actually have a way to fund those if we know that it's affecting the way we want to fight? Right now, we fund a program. We expect a long range of trying to predict the future that we need, and we're not always great at doing that. So how can we get after this portfolio in the way we actually can do this at pace, do more iterations, do shorter leaps more often? And again, that gets us back to the bottom of the last thing the VCNO wants to say is unmanned is, is, is this test bed. This is where he wants to play right now because he sees the opportunity in the space. But these are all fundamental lessons that everywhere in the Navy should be able to adopt if this provides the value and if this is right. Again, exploring that traditional space, those long existing programs of record, the long force design, the major capital ships, those are not going away. The demand for the regular fleet, the air wing of the future is not diminishing in any way, shape or form. But the question is, outside of those programs of record, are there things that we can deliver that we can focus on that either improve those capabilities, bring those capabilities sooner to the fleet, buy down the risk for those major programs when they're coming out? And again, if you want to talk about the, the bottom side of that is, what's that enabling infrastructure and technology? Do we have the data centers? Do we have the people? Do we have the schools? Do we have the skills? Do we actually have the ability to adopt these things at pace if we do find the ways and the right things to deliver? Super fast slide. If you laid out all the normal decision process and the way you could actually do this, this is a long, long process from the time somebody comes up with an idea, talks to a fleet, gets somebody else, gets it to a resource requirement, gets it in the palm, gets to an acquisition strategy, gets to deliver. That's years and years down the road. Is there a way we could have all communities at the table so that we didn't have to revisit assumptions at every step and every handoff? So again, that's the, the fundamental idea is this cross-functional team must be inclusive of as, as many people as possible, but it will fundamentally have fleet acquisitions, NRD, and requirements uh, managers all on the same team. Again, the idea is having a team that is actually focused on the outcomes and the missions and things that we can actually accomplish is gonna break down some of those places where our traditional programs or our traditional organization incentivizes maybe stovepiped or incongruent kind of efforts. Um, I'm kind of speeding through those last ones. Before I turn it over to questions, that was possibly a horrible introduction, but um, what I want to say is right now, it's been really encouraging from the last year of trying to get the understanding of what we ought to be doing and seeing the VCNO and ASN on a weekly basis, sitting there and staring across the table, what are you doing for me today? Getting to that point, where there's actually the demand, there's the draw to do something different. VCNO you know, consistently is having the message to us that says, are you sure that's enough? I think some of us are giving some, some, some safe ideas. That's not what is scaring him. That's not what's challenging him. Again, they want to see us succeed and they want to see actual change. Um, the other thing to take away from this, again, everyone's involved in this, even if you're on a core part of the team, the core team is actually just to communicate with everybody that's doing great work finding the right things, discovering the right things, and making sure there's a champion through that whole process continuously, not, not tied to a, to a calendar or a time frame. 
So in the last couple of months, though, is I think what's different getting to the point of trying to announce the task force, when it's going to be public, when we're actually going to have the operating model, when we're going to have a construct that everybody slaps the table on, I think is coming near. Uh, the last few meetings particularly have been really interesting as you're starting to see everybody is nodding their heads as opposed to the naysayers, people crossing their arms. That part is not happening anymore. Everybody is agreeing. Everybody's actually starting to get excited. And it's kind of funny when you watch a bunch of three and four stars sit around a table and actually smile and, and get along. Um, doesn't happen often in my career. So I completely overshot the time, but I will still take questions as long as people want to. A couple things that I'm going to say help me dodge of getting in any sort of trouble. The campaign has not been publicly announced, or the fact that we are standing up a task force to operationalize the campaign and get after unmanned is public. What the physical makeup of the team hasn't been fully decided, how it's resourced, and some of the operations. I will tell you there's a lot more teeth behind the 150 ideas the leadership team did not accept. Um, so there is ideas on how we're going to do this. So help me, I guess, stay away from some of those tricky questions where I'm going to get out in front of ASN or, or VCNO, but I'm happy to talk about the philosophies, why we think this is right, how we think this could actually change, how many iterations, what time frames. I'm happy to do those questions. Good afternoon, uh, Lieutenant Leon from MPS. Um, my question was on your section regarding the a la carte, right? Uh, we can plug and play capabilities and feel what we need. Out of all of that, what do you believe that is the part that should be the Navy or, this, or the DOD should help to those programs, right? Because you also have, you know, Boeing and, you know, all these other, you know, players in this game that need to, you know, be able to make money for, for lack of a better term but uh where's the part that you see okay this is what we need to control for us to control in order to create these you know non-stop stove pipe solutions so i'm going to give you a very non-committal probably opnav type answer i'm not sure we know i think we have our assumptions of what we think we ought to own what would allow us to move fast um Again, I can point to areas where I, I, I think the, the process that we're working on and having the team is to be able to quantify that, that type of statement. Things that we already know, again, things like LUSV, MUSV, those CONOPs of vessels that are going to go out and be an autonomous system without human interface for months on end. I don't see a commercial company solving that problem without a specific DOD investment. Do I say that that has to be done inside the DOD? No. But who else is, I mean, if you look at the autonomous shipping ships and the idea of the shipping industry, they still look for point to point solutions. Somebody will do the maintenance when it hits the next port. They're trying to minimize distance between two points so that they are, are out there for a short time. The Navy is the first group that says, you know what, I'd love something that goes out and does donuts in the ocean for 30 days, 90 days. Nobody else is looking for that high level of resiliency, the redundancy of systems. So how are we gonna actually challenge industry to get to that point? Or is that something the Navy fundamentally owns? I think those challenges, we're getting real close on having the data that says, when is, when is that technology going to meet the Navy's need? And if it's not, again, that's the triggering point that we have. So I think there's some of you that have seen some of the other analysis that we've been trying to do on the inside. But that is fundamentally getting the time frame and hitting the right stride of, if we were to leave industry alone in this, in this sector, when is it going to deliver? And if it's at a time frame that we're willing to accept, We'll let them drive the R&D dollars. But I think one of those fundamental things, we can look right now at LUSV, the hm &E reliability for a system to last that long without human interface um, is something that we have to take care of. Congress has actually directed we take care of that. We're going to lose the live stream. So you can stay here and answer questions all evening if you want to, but we'll lose our live stream here in just a minute. So, ladies and gentlemen, Craig Sawyer, the unmanned campaign plan that is not public or publicly released, but philosophically talked about, right? It is coming soon. Coming soon. Craig Sawyer, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Craig, thanks. Um, all right, so uh, you, you, you uh, anchored us today. 
I, I appreciate that. And I know how much work you put into this again. Um, what we have, so we've got, I've got a couple announcements for y'all. There are going to be refreshments and then I think uh, some snacks here uh, in the evening and, and more, more collaboration. So Craig, are you, do you get to, are you, are you okay to stay and answer questions? I, I, absolutely. Okay, I mean, great. Uh, so Craig will be here. I also want to, uh, I think I'm going to say this correct, but we have one academia, uh, two, two people from academia. Is Chris, where's Chris? Chris in the back, can you raise your hand in the back during the, the network hour? So it's, uh, there's two people from Duke University here. Uh, they're under, and I'm gonna get this probably wrong, but ONR funded to complete their doctorates. And then I think they're gonna be guns for hire in the, in the applied physics arena. So if you do applied physics or wanna talk with them, maybe from a warfare center or from a PEO or know of someone who could use that kind of mind, uh, let's, you know, vector them to that, to that right person. And I've got a POC, and you're out of what, working right now at a keyport? Where's Johannes? Is Johannes? I saw him, maybe he's in the back. Keep, keep at keyport, but, uh, you know, have brains willing to travel. So um, for, for us warfare centers out there that do applied physics, Please take a moment and uh, and talk with Chris and uh, and and his uh, and his teammate. Um, and then also for the band. So we had some live music yesterday. We're actually moving things. It's pretty hot out. We're going to move in things inside on the summit stage. So that's where we'll have uh, the, the the indoor area. We've also so what I've also done to try to keep people out of the sun because uh, um, we don't want anybody having heat stroke for the next couple of days is we've gotten rid of all the tables from the 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 ash asphalt in the center there and up along the fence line where the picnic tables are behind uh, uh, where, where some of the uh, exhibitors were, you'll see some tables back there. It's a little bit cooler. Go back into that area and it's cooler. And then there's uh, tables under the, uh, um, under the, the canopies as well. So I think we're laying on zero nine. Are we starting zero nine tomorrow? So zero nine back here. I'm sure I'll be emceeing something and saying something provocative and pejorative as I usually do with my foot in my mouth. All right, thanks everybody. I really appreciate your time and, and coming to the summit and I hope you have a great evening and then we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much.